Hey guys welcome to part 2 of what if Naruto was trained by Anko if you enjoy the video then like share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more videos of your liking and also check out my other playlist hope you would like them too. So let's get started. Chapter 4, E Ranked. Silence reigned as the figure dressed in orange and blue darted from tree limb to tree limb looking for somewhere to hide. It seemed like a never ending search, he had hidden most everywhere in this section of forest, at some point over the last month. Seriously Anko was going has to let him expand the area of this game if she wanted a challenge. Coming to a stop he looked around mind racing as he tried to think of where to go. The hollow tree no he'd used that day before yesterday. Those bushes. No. He'd used those last week and they had poison ivy growing underneath them anyway. Like any good prey he had no delusions of being a ninja right then minus he sensed the murderous Anko closing in on him. He needed to find something and quick. Lacking other options he jumped off the limb he had been perched on to another one and doubled back, praying that he could pass unnoticed beneath Anko. Nalto ducked down, lowering his speed and using a weak henge to appear as a small squirrel. Maybe she would not notice him now, hopefully it would buy him the few seconds he needed to get past Ho and to a more suitable location. He paused acting like a squirrel watching as Anko passed, overhead and then disappeared into the foliage. She'd missed him. Letting out a breath, he let his hand collapse, wondering why even after all this time he was still having a bit of a problem with it. The sexy jutsu which Anko had approved of minus he could hold for an hour easily with very little effort, but any other type of hand would only last for a few minutes at most without his complete concentration. Shaking it off, realizing that he was still standing there in the open he turned and started moving. Silent as possible he jumped from tree branch to tree branch working to use his chakra to lessen the impact on the tree limbs as Anko had taught him. He still could not do that perfectly either, though she said he was doing better. Shaking his head he turned his attention back to his surroundings looking for a worthwhile place to hide. Then, as if the kami was smiling, Nalto found a clearing where a beam of sunlight danced across the ground to cast delicate shadows over a large white square rock. It even seemed too, as something engraved on it, not that it mattered. All that mattered was that it was the only place, he had not hidden in and thus the one place that Anko would never think of him trying to hide. Darting down into the clearing, he ignored the writing and came to a rest against the shadow cloaked side of the white square stone. Now came the hard part, he had to try one of the two jutsus his sensor had taught him. Concentrating he slowed his breathing, attempting to think like a stone. It was hard work, requiring a lot more control over his chakra than he thought he could ever manage yet he managed to pull off the Maizaigoko no jutsu allowing his entire body to blend into the shape to match the form and color patterns of the stone. Trying to control his breathing he waited wondering how many more minutes or hours he had until this game of hide and hunt was over. Maybe this time he could win and she would let him have some time off. There were a few people that needed to be put in their place. Plus he really did not want to practice any more Teivutsu with Anko at least not until she forgave him for the laxatives he had added to her dango yesterday. Frowning he forced his mind back onto the camouflage technique he was using. There was a snap of twig and he panicked, causing his technique to waver. Quickly he forced it back into place. Clenching his eyes shut, he prayed that it was not Anko that was approaching, or that if it was he would not be beaten to a bloody pulp. Hmm. A male voice said, oh well. Breathing a bit easier, Nalto closed his eyes. As long as it was not Anko, he should not have to worry too much. Shisui. Thank you. The male said blandly, before another twig snapped and he spoke again. Anko Semapi. Oh. Anko's voice said, forcing Nalto to gulp hold his breath and struggle to keep his technique in place. Itaki what are you doing here? Visiting the set box. Itaki answered a note of curiosity entering his voice. Is there something you are looking for? Hey, just an annoying little prick. Anko said happily. Short, blonde hair rude as hell, wears a gaudy orange outfit. Seen him around. No Itaki responded, is this that Azumaki? How'd you know? I was in the forest, when he defeated Mizukai. Oh. Well, let me know if you see him around. I need to kick his ass. Anko chirped before the sound of her taking off back into the forest reached Nalto. Once he was sure Anko was really gone the blonde let out a loud breath then realized that the man was still there. Nalto clenched his eyes praying that the man had not noticed. All he needed was for this Itaki to tell Anko where he was. If you over concentrate on that technique it fails horribly. 
Itaki said blandly before taking off as well. Naruto could not help but let his camouflage technique crumble in shock. The man had known he was there the whole damn time. Then it dawned on him, Anko had never found him. Yes. He'd win this time for sure. Ha. In your face you psychotic bitch. Naruto muttered under his breath, jumping to his feet. In my face. Anko asked curiously from behind him. Naruto couldn't help but whimper. Anko very was happy whistling a tune while twirling a kunai around her finger. Today was going to be the day, after a full month of training and torturing. Today she would collect her promised to be ranked mission. Probably something relatively simple considering that this would be the first, the Naruto, but nothing too easy. Maybe she would collect more than one, that way when they finished one off she could move them right on to the next. Now, best to take things one at a time. Entering the Hoka's tower she glanced around, and then nodded, heading past the rows of desks and toward the mission assignment hall. The first thing she noted besides the fact that almost all the male genin were trying to I hope body minus, was that an awful lot of teens were present. Was there some kind of problem with the mission assignments? Scowling she continued on her way, not paying attention to a single team as she passed them by. Anko was not one to be denied, she had paid her dues she had trained Nalto to the best he could achieve in a month. And now she should, as her damn mission. Reaching the doors, she found her way blocked by several un members who were casually leaning against the walls, watching everyone. That did not bode well. There was only one reason for un to be present in the mission hall like this, there was a debriefing going on. Which could take hours. Damn it. Anko muttered glaring at the doors. Her thoughts were disturbed when the door to the mission hall opened, and a hurried-looking Oka stepped out into the hallway. Anko. The scared Chunin said in surprise, and then laughed nervously, scratching the back of his head. Hey. I suppose you're here for your mission. That would be a reason to at the mission hall, now wouldn't it? Anko deadpanned. Oh. Right, well her. The Hokid asked me to announce that all Genin missions would be handed out upstairs in the backup mission hall. Oka smiled nervously and repeated the announcement for everyone else. Anko however did not move blocking Oka's path as everyone else grumbling turned and headed to the stairs. Oka kun. I'd really like my mission now. Anko said, sweetly twirling her kunai once more. Oich. That really wouldn't be fair minus. I want a mission now. Anko said flatly, grabbing the kunai in mid-spin, eyes narrowed dangerously. Oich h. Right, right. Oka stammered, retreating inside, before returning with a stack of papers. Gulping Oka quickly riffled through them before, producing one and handing it to her. Here. Anko snatched it away, scanning the details then glared at him crumpling the paper. No D ranked. B but. Your. Oka stopped seeing the way she narrowed her eyes even more. W we has a few C rank minus. B Anko said harshly. I want to be ranked mission. Like I was promised. Be ranked. Oka, repeated before scowling. I'm not giving you a be ranked mission. Anko growled, leaning forward threateningly. I want. A be ranked. Mission. Oka narrowed his own eyes leaning toward her holding his ground. No. If I don't get one I am personally going to show you how exactly to skin someone alive. Anko promised, malice and killing intent radiating off her. I am. Not. Giving. Your. Team. A B ranked. Mission. Oka said. Lifting his chin defiantly. Why not? Anko asked her voice still threatening. She would have loved to shut a kunai through his throat and just take the mission herself but. That would be noticed and she really did not feel like getting bloody. Nalto couldn't possibly be ready for one. Oka answered steadily. Besides which we don't has any B-ranked missions right now. I know my teammate better than you. If I say he can handle B-ranked, he can handle one. Anko stated, evenly leaning back to Glower at the scared tune-in, surprised that he would actually has enough backbone to stand up to her. We might as one at noon. Oka said slowly. Not breaking eye contact with her. But you will has to get it from the Hokid directly. I will not assign it. Fine. Anko said. Then smiling turned and walked away whistling and twirling her kunai once more. The sun shone bright in the sky as errant clouds drifted across the vast expanse of blue. 
It was the sort of afternoon could be said to has inspired the notion of the midday nap. Near the edge of a training area, resting on a slopping bed of comfortable grass was a dark-haired boy. With his arms behind his head and legs crossed near the ankles, he looked for all the world like he was sleeping. Indeed, this could be given further credence by the fact that other than a few bird songs, the only noise was the near-sleep rhythm of his breathing. A casual observer might even think that this child was some sort of master in the art of relaxation, so perfect was the setting and all indications of concern and anxiety completely absent from his body. But then, even the thunderheads at the edge of a thunderstorm will appear serene when viewed from a distance. Stifling a yawn, the boy stared up dispassionately at the thin wisps of clouds overhead wondering as always why clouds could have such trouble-free lives. Cloud watching had always been one of this favorite pastimes a welcomed relief to a lazy child from his daily tasks, however these days the boy's mind was so troubled that even this beloved escape could not help. In Nara Shikamaru's life up to this point two things had been discovered that could truly motivate this notoriously lazy child, his mother's anger and the welfare of his friends. Just over a month ago he had in a moment like this, reflected upon his future, and correctly predicted that his graduation from the Ninja Academy would reduce his exposure to the first of these forces. Not that his mother treated him any differently, now he simply had a better reason to avoid home. He had not, however, anticipated the effect graduating would affect the second. For some reason the fates, in their infinite wisdom had decided to assign him to a team of fellow genin. Made up of two pliant introverts and a sensor, whose laziness rivaled his own. He felt a mixture of annoyance and relief when he considered his teammates. One was a Kimikai Chovi whom he had known since he was a child and who he considered his closest friend yet Chovi rarely expressed interest in or opinions on anything non-food related. The other was Hayuga Hinata a girl so timid, shy and apparently insecure that her voice never rose above a whisper. As for their sensor, Satobi Asuma, the man expressed a firm instructional belief that the best way to teach was to leave his students to their own devices allowing them work through situation on their own, and thus learn from the mistakes they made. Shikamaru had to admit that he was impressed by the Jonin's cleverness. This sink or swim pedagogy left the lazy man with very few responsibilities, only requiring him to become directly involved with his students if the situation absolutely necessitated it. From what Shikamaru had seen a situation meeting, his sensei's requirements for intervention would probably mean the near imminent death of at least one of his teammates. Because of this Shikamaru, who had always desired a simple life and would have been quite content as a baker or a storekeeper if only explaining the decision to his mother would not have been so troublesome minus found himself as de facto leader of his genin team. Damn it he thought to himself, allowing his concentration to momentarily slip as a string of colorful curses drifted through his mind. Why couldn't a more natural leader like Sheno has been put on his team? Or even one of those bossy, noisy girls, Sakura, or Inno. Either of them would have leapt at the opportunity to tell people what to do. Instead, during his precious cloud watching time, he was motivated, compelled even, to think about his team's strengths and weaknesses and to try to devise ways to ensure that none of them would be hurt or killed during their missions. Grinding his teeth, Shikamaru began thinking through methods that they could use to signal each other without risk of detection. Needless to say, his mood grew steadily darker. Why did he have to be the leader? This train of thought was interrupted by an overly loud voice calling his name. Shikamaru lifted a hand in front of his face to block the sun and stare up at a grinning blonde dressed in orange. Nalto. While not the most bothersome thing in the academy, the orange-clad boy had definitely been within the top ten. Oi, Shikamaru. What are you doing out here alone? Nalto asked happily plopping down beside him. Sighing Shikamaru looked back at the clouds. Asuma Sensei said to meet here. Ho. For training. Nalto asked, reclining beside Shikamaru, his hands behind his head. I'm getting sick of it, all this damn training. I mean, I thought we were done learning things after the academy you know. Shikamaru closed his eyes manfully repressing his groan. If only Asuma spent his time training them then maybe he would not need to worry so much. Then his mind started turning over what the boy next to him was saying, how he was rattling on and on about training. Wait. Nalto did not have a team, how could he have a sensor and be training? This is troublesome. Shikamaru said finally, cutting the blonde off at last. Nalto everyone knows you don't have a team or a sensor. Pretending that you do and that you are continuing your career as a ninja is pointless. I'm not pretending. Nalto shouted sitting up quickly glaring down at him. 
Anko's insane and may be trying to kill me, but she is still my sensei and teaching me stuff. All this damn Taijutsu, and weapons, and chakra control training. Sighing again Shikamaru closed his eyes wondering why the fates had devised a new way to torture him this morning. Naruto clearly did not know how fortunate he was. No parent to force him into things no teammates to worry about now that he was free of the academy, he could go and live a nice simple trouble-free life. Yet he insisted on holding onto this troublesome delusion. Naruto first I've never heard of this Anko and second. If you really had graduated from the academy, you would have a team and would have been on several troublesome missions by now. I did. Ho. Shikamaru let out a heavy breath opening his eyes obviously it would fall to him to try and get this boy to understand a simple matter. Everybody has been going on missions for the last month. Basically just the rank ones now, little errands and tasks around the village, but I expect that they will get more troublesome soon. A bit of apprehension crept into his voice at the end just thinking about his team on such a mission. As troublesome as it is, they are required. And so I don't see how you could spend the month just training. Since I have seen every other genin from our class, numerous times either at mission hall or in the village, performing their assignments you are almost definitely never became a genin and B, are a horrible and troublesome liar. B, but I am a genin and do has a sensor. Nalto said jumping to his feet. She's been trying to kill me for most of the past month, but she's taught me a couple of jutsus and and. Shikamaru shook his head, tossing a small stone into the sky in mild frustration. If only his real sensor was half as motivated as Naruto's imaginary one seemed to be. This entire morning was proving to be much too troublesome. Has you been on a mission? Shikamaru finally asked interrupting Naruto. When Naruto shook his head, Shikamaru sighed. Then it's obvious you're not a real genin. It's troublesome to say the same thing over and over. Everyone really has been going on missions. Naruto asked in a small voice. Yes including that bastard Sasu. Yes. His team was even assigned an incredibly troublesome C-ranked mission. Involuntarily Shikamaru shivered at the though. C-rank missions carried a good chance of real combat, a prospect he dreaded facing with his team. They left the village nearly two weeks ago to go to wave country as bodyguard to a bridge builder or something. Finishing Shikamaru paused, his mind wandering again. As their leader, would he be able to keep Chozi and Hainata safe? when they were assigned missions like this. Lost in these thoughts it was not until several minutes had passed that he opened his eyes to find that he was alone. Sighing Shikamaru turned his eyes back to the sky and tried to relax. However his mind returned to the signaling method that he had been working out earlier. His teammates would be arriving soon and he needed to has it ready for them. They would not have much time train before they would have to go to mission hall to get their day's assignment and he did not expect his sensei to have anything to teach them. Scowling, he threw another stone into the sky as he muttered quietly to himself, troublesome. This is all much too troublesome. Sighing Anko finished her dango and then swinging her legs sent the stick sailing into the wall before her completing the candy for brutality. Hopping off her post she stretched then turned heading once more into the Hokiv tower where she was promptly greeted by an office worker. He excuse me, the young woman stammered, gulping. H. Hokid Sama asked you us to tell why you that he wants to see why you. That said the woman recoiled covering her head. Please don't kill me. Anko blinked then sighed and shoved past, the girl heading for the stairs. She was really going to has to see about clearing up this misconception that she was a cold-blooded killer. That was her sensor. Not her damn it. Grumbling about stupid people, that couldn't tell the difference Anko stormed up the stairs and then, without her usual flamboyance, started for the Hokage's office. Pushing the door open she entered the room flopping into a chair, in front of the old man's desk. You wanted to see me. Indeed. Sandium said, coming through a door that led off to the Hokage's private room. Anko watched as he crossed the room and sat down heavily behind his desk, for once not smoking his pipe. So. A month. Anko blinked frowning. Yay. You have been teaching Naruto for a full month, alone and unsupervised. Sandame said, before he selected a thin folder and opened it. Do you really believe he is ready to be ranked mission? Yay. Anko said carelessly, frowning a little more. Why do you drag me all the way up here? Because two people has made their reservations known. Sandame said, eyes calculating before they returned to the folder. One of course is worried for the boy's welfare. 
both mentally and physically. The other one, I suspect, is mainly acting on old grudges. Sitting upright Anko narrowed her eyes. What kind of reservations? Well, I believe Kurenai Chan worded it as Anko-san absolutely should not be endangering a young genin with teaching methods that are learned from her sensor. Nalto kun has already demonstrated an aggressive personality and under her tutelage this could become both more pronounced and dangerous. Sandame answered, reading from the folder. Looking up he raised an eyebrow. Care to put my mind at ease. That stupid little. Anko muttered, her glare intensifying on the folder before she looked at the hokage. Yay, Nalto's a lil prick with a short fuse. I'm trying to channel that to more productive means. I see. Sandame nodded. Looking back at the folder. As the Yurka Khan, he is merely addressing the fact that Nalto has been clearly agitated concerning you and a belief that you were trying to kill him. He is worried about the boy also, since he claims to have seen blood on Nalto's jumpsuit several times. He calls me a psychotic bitch. I break his nose. We're the prefect team. Anko said in exasperation before holding her hand out. Look, can I just has my mission now? Anko please tell me that you are not rushing his training. Sandane said leaning back in his chair. I would hate to think that you would be risking his life in the hurry to return to high-ranking missions. I'm not. Anko sighed, reaching up to rub at her temples. Nalto is as ready as any genin ever could be. You do remember our deal correct. Sandane said selecting another folder, this one sealed, offering it to her. You must keep Nalto Kun alive. Yay, yay. Anko said indifferently as she took the folder and broke the seal. Grinning she looked up at the hokid snapping it shut. Great. Well, we shouldn't be gone too long. That said she turned and strode out of the room without waiting for a dismissal. Hatak Kakashi was known for being a very laid-back person. So laid-back that there were even rumors of certain items of an illicit nature, being responsible. The simple truth was Kakashi was a laid, back person much the same way that the Sandame was serious and Nalto the infamous trickster of the village minus was loud. So true uh. Items of an illicit nature. Were not involved. Unless you counted Ika Ika Paradise as such. Kakashi still burned in a suppressed fury, just remembering what it was like too, has his precious book snatched away from him. That however, is beside the point. What is the focus currently is that he is a very laid back person. That was at least until he heard Anko's plans from a still nervous Urka, just now he was every inch the Unbu commander that he was supposed to be. His precious book had been put up, his voice had become a bit rougher more commanding. An Unbu had been dispatched immediately to keep an eye on Anko's denin while two others watched her. Orders had been to observe and delay if needed until Kakashi could consult with the Hokage. This had proven more difficult than expected, since the Hokage's Unbu bodyguards had lost track of him. Then again according to all of Kakashi's predecessors' accounts, it was almost a requirement that a Hokid could disappear on them without notice. After all they were Hokid for a reason. Still Kakashi managed to track the Sandame down finally. Kakashi found him standing on top of the Hokid tower, staring up at the face of the Yondem, his red and white robe fluttering around him. How the Unbu acting as his guards had missed that he had no clue. Kakashi made a mental note of checking their credentials once more. With an extra burst of chakra, he leapt up the side of the building landing behind the Sandame who didn't did not even look around at his sudden arrival. Hokid Sama. What is it Kakashi-san? Standing upright from Kakashi approached the Hokid, his voice uncharacteristically serious. I received word that you gave Anko Sanabi ranked mission. Ah, the Hokid said then remained silent before speaking again. Yes I did. May I ask which one was it exactly? The diplomatic mission to the country of grass. Sandame replied tiredly. Oka said that the Daimyo's ambassador is already at the rendezvous point with his samurai bodyguard and Kesivi Ryo, the Daimyo's three-year-old daughter. This could prove problematic. Kakashi said. He was a tad lost. Why only two ninja? Not just any two either. But Nato and Anko. Why would the Hokage want an unstable ninja and an equally unstable genin to take the mission? It sounded like a very important, very delicate and dangerous mission. There was no logical reason for the Hokid to want them to take the mission. Unless. The Hokid knew something he didn't, or at least believed he knew something that Kakashi didn't. Has you ever wondered why exactly the Yondam was found in that nursery? 
Sandame inquired in a tired voice. Sensa was always strange. Kakashi admitted, raising an eyebrow. What did this have to do with Anko's antics? I have been wondering lately. There are some things that just do not add up. Sandame muttered, finally turning to stare at Kakashi. Let her and Nalto handle the mission but add whatever unboo detail you think would be best. Just make sure they understand that they are to be an unseen and unnoticed presence, not to become involved unless there is no other option. Hokid Sama. This way we get both Nalto and Anko out of the village. Sandame snickered. Peace at last. Kakashi felt all of his seriousness melt away as he watched the powerful man disappear into the building. Well, better inform the others. Reaching into his pouch he produced the headset. Kakashi 2 surveillance on Team Anko, stand down. When he received confirmation he glanced up at his old sensor, then shook his head walking to the edge of the building. Kakashi 2 tracker Team 5. Target Team Anko. Orders are to monitor and intervene only if need merits. Maybe he could find a nice tree to finish his precious Ika Ika in. Anko entered the training area to find Nalto, who was for all intents and purposes trying to shatter a training post as he drove his punches into it. She stopped taking a moment to watch his form noting that it was still sloppy and wild, yet underlying that was the beginning of a fluidity required for the Teivutsu he had been bastardizing. Anko couldn't help but smile, knowing that the Sandame had not been lying a month ago when he said that Nalto was unusual. Enormous chakra capacity rapid recovery from almost anything she could inflict on him, he learned quickly as long as he was learning with his body, just she had created hide and hunt minus. Nalto had the potential to be an excellent ninja someday. Though if it had been her sensor, the boy would have been dead three days into training. If not to his lack of apparent potential, then to his total lack of finesse. Then she saw how he was punching. How had that managed to escape her all this time? It was slow as hell and he was not even throwing it right. Faster. Anko finally said, her tone empty. Like a cobra when it strikes. Nalto stopped for a moment, turning to stare and then scowling, he turned back his fist snapping out in almost a blur. Didn't they teach you to punch in the academy? Anko questioned harshly, before walking over to grab his fist. Jerking it up so that he could see Anko, slapped his first two knuckles. You hit with those and put your damn hip into it. Shutting his hand away she sounded disgusted. Now punch the damn post. Nalto did as ordered, almost instantly wincing in pain. He started to say something, then narrowing his eyes he punched the post again. And again. And again. Rotate your hand. Anko said after a moment, her tone neutral. Your entire arm rotates including your wrist, when you punch. Remember there's five parts to a punch the chamber direction, extension rotation and rechamber. Stupid. Nalto muttered and punched again, nailing the post as hard as he could. Nodding in mild satisfaction, she reached out to ruffle his hair only to has him duck and move away. He continued to glare at her, almost angrily. Ah, uh, he was probably just tired of all this training. I've decided to cancel training for the day. Anko announced happily, then seeing his continued glare started glaring herself. What the hell is wrong with you? Whoopee. Nalto grumbled, his tone trembling in anger. I get time off from training. Big deal not like I get to do anything else. Anko remained silent, knowing that more would come without her prompting. Damn it. How come I'm the only genin that never goes out on missions? Her. Huh. Everybody thinks I'm lying about graduating about being a genin at all. So what? Who cares what they think? I'm tired of training. I want to go on a mission. I want to show everyone that I'm not just a dead last loser from the academy pretending to be a ninja. Nalto shouted, his eyes almost watering. You want to know why we've done nothing but train? Anko retorted sharply. It's because I was determined not to go on those damn D and C ranked missions. I wanted you good enough that we could do the and the ranked missions. Sasuke's already minus. What the hell does that matter? Anko cut him off angrily. He's a stupid Uchiha. If you're going to has a rival you should pick one that doesn't has a family that are a bunch of thieves. Hell the only ones with the damn Sharigan that are worth while are Itaki and Kakashi. But if I don't then secure a Chan minus. Wake up. Anko shouted cutting him off yet again. You aren't even friends with that girl. You'll never be friends. 
let alone her boyfriend. She's completely fixated on that little butchia bastard that you're obsessing over. Grow up. When Ninja knocked villagers in school. When all Nalto could do was stare at her she snorted and produced the folder she'd gotten from the sand dame. Now, if this pre theme emo moment is over can you please focus on the fact that I've cancelled training because I've got us a juicy B ranked mission. A mission. Nalto suddenly shouted, apparently recovered from his depression. Honest. Yep. A real mission. Just like they should be. Anko cheered, it took you a month to get ready, but now we can do it. Hey. So what is the mission? We get to protect the daimyo, or a princess, or fight a whole army. Nalto gloated, rubbing his hands together excitedly. Anko stared at him for a moment, assessing if he was really ready for this. Once she committed there would be no turning back and if she was wrong she'd she would be stuck teaching in the academy. But the glint in his eyes reassured, and she grinned. It's a diplomatic mission to grass country. We'll be bodyguarding the fire daimyo's ambassador and his three-year-old daughter. We got a really great mission. People always want to kill princesses. Right. Nalto suddenly shouted running out of the training area only to come back a few minutes later. Oh. You better lead the way. Barker. You can't just run off on a mission like this with only the clothes on your back. Here. Fishing into one of the pockets of her trench coat, she pulled out a crumpled piece of paper. Handing it to Nalto she continued. This is a list of basic equipment you are going to need. Get all the items on this list and meet me at the main gate in two hours. Turning she paused to glance back at him with a smile that chased all the blood from his face. Don't be late. Then she was gone, and he was alone. Nalto hesitated outside the store entrance, he knew that this was not going to be easy his childhood behavior had not made him many friends among the Kanoa merchants with the notable exception of the vendor of the village's finest ramen minus could he help it if some of the village's merchants were cheats and that he truly enjoyed exposing them. Unfortunately the Kanoa Merchants Guild was a tight-knit organization where rumors spread easily. Stories of his exploits, some justified and many fabricated were commonly traded by its members demonizing the boy to the extent that most of the village's merchants associated Nalto's patronage of their shops with imminent financial ruin. Of course this made it very difficult for him to buy anything in the village, most shops would turn him away at the door or chase him out if he managed to sneak inside. Thus the things he owned were limited to primarily hand-me-downs and discarded items. Thus Nalto had become very skilled at living on what he had at hand, but this skill would not help him gather gather all the items on the list Anko had given him and he did not want to disappoint her. He understood the ramifications of that would be more painful than any he might encounter sneaking into a store. Closing his eyes and focusing Nalto flashed through the required hand seals, then with a puff of smoke he disappeared to be replaced by a lightly tanned dark-haired boy wearing a nondescript light brown shirt and khaki shorts. Unless they could detect the hent, would suspect that this boy was in fact Nalto. Carefully Nalto took a step forward, glancing at his appearance in the shop window. He had never been good at hent and, even though his skills had improved through his training with Anko, it still took a tremendous amount of concentration for him to maintain the technique. Any momentary break in his focus would cause it to fail immediately. Taking a breath Nalto entered the shop, very careful to make sure that he did not trip over or bump into anything. The room he entered was huge, a giant warehouse containing every sort of ninja equipment imaginable, all shelved or hanging in neat aisles. Nalto wanted to curse, it would take hours for him to find everything on Anko's damn list. Even if by some miracle, he could hold his hen but long Anko would undoubtedly find and kill him for being late long before he gathered everything. Hello. Welcome to Ninmart. Sang out a perky cheery high-pitched voice from behind him, which caused him to jump. He felt his hand waver, but managed to keep it intact. Turning slowly focusing on maintaining his hand, his gaze met a brightly dressed teenage sales girl who clearly possessed more enthusiasm for her job than any sane person should. Can I help you find something? Tentatively Nalto handed her the list that Anko had given him. Scanning it she frowned ever so slightly, eventually glancing up at the boy in question. This is quite a list. What sort of budget do you have for this? Nalto in response, pulled out his balding frog wallet Gama Chan. Now while the Hokage's office provided a very modest stipend for orphans, years of involuntary frugal living had allowed Nalto to feed the money to Gama Chan until the wallet was ready to burst. The sales girl took the wallet her, frown vanishing, as she saw the amount contained inside. 
Suddenly her eyes widened, and a trace of drool appeared at the corner of her mouth. When she looked back at him, her eyes seemed to sparkle at the thought of the commission she would be receiving. This is wonderful. Oh no sorry. I mean you has made a wonderful choice in coming to Ninmart, where we happily service all your ninja needs at prices that cannot be beaten. Nalto grimaced inwardly, the sales girl had been bubbly before, but now she was practically gushing. As she led him through the aisles all the time going on about what was currently en vogue in Ninda fashion, Nalto felt a sense of dread spreading through him. Now this collection of field packs, just arrived last week. They are not among our budget line, but the added value is well worth the extra price. Why look at these gorgeous little designer labels? Aren't they just to die for? Nalto wanted to tell the woman that he did not give a damn about designer labels or ninja fashion as long as it had orange in it that is minus but he had discovered that every time he tried to speak his hand would waver dangerously. So he was forced to remain silent. Not that the sale girl seemed to notice. She just kept cheerfully running him through the aisles, chattering as she continued to add items to a growing pile in his arms. Now I know these were not on your list, but I really think any self-respecting ninja needs them. They like so suit. Your ninja fashion and are just so cute. She said flashing him a pretty smiles, one of the deadliest weapons a skilled saleswoman has against male customers, as she held up a pair of elegant leather vambraces. A pair of elegant leather vambraces with metal studs interspersed within a flowery paisley pattern. Nalto grimaced but decided that maybe they would be a nice gift to Sakura yea he could give them to her and she had be so grateful that. That. What the hell was he thinking? Anko was going to skin him alive, if he did not find all the items on her damn list and get out of there soon. Glancing at the clock on the wall, then at his list he felt like sobbing, they were only a third of the way done and he had maybe a little over an hour left till he had two met Anko. Just then a bell over the door to the shop clanged as a tall ninja, with circular dark sunglasses and black bandana tied over his hair, entered. Looking away from Nalto at the door, the young saleswoman paled slightly her body tensing. Composing herself, she quickly brought a smile to her lips. Hello, Epsi san I will be with you in just a few minutes. Take your time, my dear. Responded the man casting her a sly smile before wandering over to peruse the racks of magazines near the front counter. While Nalto couldn't be certain, it looked like the man had picked up the hottest hot springs issue of Shinobi Illustrated and slid it into a copy of Shirkian and Kunai. Pretending that he was keeping up on the latest in ninja weapons, when he was really ogling pictures of Kunoichi at the bathhouse. Damn closet pervert. At any other time Nalto would have loved to expose the man for what he was, but at the moment, he instead offered a small prayer to the kami for sending the man. His presence seemed to spur the young woman helping Nalto to complete his order with a new vigor. I am very sorry to rush you sir. Here at Ninmart we value all of our customers equally especially when they are interested in making large purchases. However, Epsi San is one of our most regular and loyal customers, Keeping up with the most recent trends in ninja fashion is very important to him. She paused and beamed. Why he was one of the first male Kanoa Shinobi to start wearing nail polish when that style reached us this spring. However, please do not get the impression that is just some blind trend follower. He chose the most glorious maroon to be his own signature color in spite of the predominance of royal purple among most of the fashionable Shinobi who had adopted that tray's chic style. Nalto was sorely tempted to let his hand go to the pleasure of cursing at her. It was hard to say which disturbed him more, the fact that Kanoa had chosen a perverted fashion theme to be one of its noble ninja, or the fact that this woman seemed to be captivated by him. It was only his ever-present image of Anko grinning as she slowly filleted him alive, that kept him focused enough to maintain his hand and his calm. At least she was thinking about something other than his ninja fashion, she had shown him more than enough cute accessories already. Which reminds me, the sales girl suddenly chimed happily. We simply must stop by the cosmetics section before I let you go. There are some simply gorgeous new nail polish shades that a truly stylish ninja like yourself must consider. Surprisingly it took only about 10 more minutes to gather the remaining items on Anko's list. To Nalto's distress though the approach taken by the sales girl assisting him was to select the most expensive option available for the items on the list completing each selection with the cheery comment only the best to our customer. If he could have voiced his opinion, he certainly would have let the woman know what he thought about the diet she was putting Gama Chan on. Placing the items on the counter Nalto gazed at the large pile of expensive goods and then at poor Gama Chan he could almost feel tears welling up in his eyes. Epsu drifted over, 
apparently having lost interest in his ogling and glanced over Nalto's shoulder at the pile. Looks like you has a big spender here. Epsi remarked cordially, glancing up at the girl who smiled back. Nalto groaned a shudder running through his body as the effects of maintaining his hen for so long sank in while the more pleasant effects of the fumes from the nail polish which he was still wearing minor steadily wore off, leaving him with a massive headache. Inwardly wincing Nalto gently reached out to tap the girl's shoulder, unfortunately this seemed to startle her and she jumped bumping into a rack of snuff boxes that had been placed at the end of the counter for customer convenience. The rack came crashing to the ground releasing a cloud that drifted into Nalto's face. What happened next was perhaps inevitable, perhaps it could even have been foretold before Nalto even set foot into the shop. Still time seemed too slow as the cloud made its way to Nalto then reaching his head and engulfed it. The spell was broken with a tremendous sneeze that was both physical and emotional release. Nalto realizing that there was no hope of getting out of there with a single item from Anko's damn list he grabbed his purse and then, while both Epsi and the sales girl were still shocked and disorientated bolted from the store. Damn it. Now what was he going to? Anko had told him to be at the gates in two hours and he had used most of that with the stupid sales girl. Furrowing his eyebrows he tried desperately to come up with a plan as he ran down the street. Thus he completely failed to notice a tall figure stepping out in front of him while, waiting to get his attention. When Nalto did manage to see the man he attempted to stop, but sadly this was too little too late, and he plowed into Oka knocking both to the ground. Oi! Oka! Nalto smiled brightly, all thoughts of the list and imminent death banished from his mind by excitement and pride. I got a mission. An important one too, be ranked. I'm going to be guarding a princess. Oka frowned climbing back to his feet and dusting himself off. Sighing he looked at Nalto, putting a supportive look on his face. Well, I can't say I'm happy about you getting this level of mission. Still congratulations, for getting your first mission. Nalto smiled brightly, putting his hands behind his head. Hey. Hey, want to get some rum to celebrate? Nalto paused for a moment. His mouth watering at the possibility of ramen. Free ramen. It had been almost three days since he had been able to escape from Anko's torture long enough to go to Ichiraki. But the brief thought of Anko brought another image to his mind an image of Anko and what she would do to him if he was late. No dawdling. Ramen would definitely count as dawdling. The thought alone sent a shiver down his spine. Steadying himself he painted the best smile he could on his face and said to Oka cursing himself with every word. Sorry Oka. Maybe when I get back you can take me out to celebrate how I kicked butt on this mission. But I really gotta get packed for this thing. Then seeing the shock on Oka's face this was the first time Nalto had ever turned down free run minus Nalto continued trying to ease the ache in his own heart and stomach. Hey do you think you could help me? I've got to get all the stuff on this list, but I got kicked out of the store when I tried to get the stuff. Oka hesitated for a minute then, glancing at Nalto suspiciously as if he could not believe he was really Nalto minus, took the list and scanned it. Nalto was an expert at reading Oka's facial expressions, he noted the signs of the teacher remembering something from his childhood and then the look of understanding. Thus he was not surprised when the scared man reached out and ruffled his hair. I think I can probably help you with most of these. The academy keeps a supply of field kits for training purposes and I'm sure, the Hokid wouldn't mind if I lent you one for this mission. Just try to take good care of it okay. Nalto could not help but feel hope flood through him, and gratitude. Anko might not kill him after all. Of course Oka Sensor. You can trust me. Good. Oka said after a moment, his own lips twitching at something funny. Meet me at the academy in about 20 minutes. In the meantime I'm em. You better do as Anko said on this list and get some decent clothes that has not been ripped to shreds and smell like they've never been washed. Nalto laughed at that and then took off for his source of all things orange and jumpsuitish. Oi! Shikamaru! The dark-haired Benin groaned as he saw Nalto moving towards them. Had his day not been troublesome enough? First this noisy blonde had disturbed his already disturbed cloud watching time. Then he had to train his teammates which was followed by yet another very troublesome D-rank mission that had once again been completed successfully. Since it was their 12th such mission Asuma had offered to take them to a Korea barbecue chovey's choice instead of the normal strategy session at the shogi parlor. Personally Shikamaru would rather go to the shogi parlor than to a social event with his teammates but chovey was so enthusiastic about the barbecue that protesting just seemed much too troublesome. 
It now appeared that Nalto was preparing to create an even more troublesome situation. Despite this distracting annoyance, Shikamaru still noticed the way that Hinata blushed and moved too hide as the blonde in question approached them. Sighing Shikamaru scowled at Nalto wondering why he ever bothered with trying for a peaceful life when the fates apparently enjoyed forcing him into troublesome situations. What is it this time Nalto? The genius asked blandly when the blonde had stopped walking. I'm going on a mission. A B ranked one even. See I'm a real genin. Nalto said smugly, smiling brighter than ever. Shikamaru winced, apparently the blonde's delusions were at it again. Why did it always fall to him to fix these things? Nalto, when are you going to accept the fact that you are not a genin? Besides, if you are going to go around making up stories at least try to make them believable. Ho. The ranked missions are restricted to Chunin and Jonin. There is no way that they would let a genin do one. Ooh, but it's true. Nalto protested. Shikamaru shook his head. Maybe he should ask Asuma to report this to the Hokage. It appeared that Nalto needed some professional help. Then he felt a presence, that had not been there a second ago, directly behind him. Actually he is a genin, about to go on a B-ranked mission. A voice whispered in his ear, the warm breath tickling him. And. He is going to have some extra special Teivutsu training when we get back unless he can give me a very good reason for not meeting me at the gate, when I told him to. Shikamaru felt his mouth going dry, watching as Nalto's face turned pale and his smile disappeared faster than a snowball in a fire. It took a great deal of effort, but Shikamaru forced himself to take a step forward, and then turned to see one of the most terrifyingly beautiful women he had ever seen. Obviously she was a kunoichi, the forehead protector unnecessary, due to the fact, he could tell from the nonchalant way she was toying with a kunai. Shikamaru was also smart enough to realize that although her body and attire were distracting if he so much as glanced away from her face he would suffer. Painfully. Turning the woman in question faced Asuma, her tone far too chipper. Asuma. How's it hanging? When the bearded Jonin coughed she continued happily. These your brats. Looks like you lucked out a group with about as much motivation as you have. Asuma merely grumbled chewing nervously at his cigarette. Well we gotta get going. You know missions and all that. So, let's wait a minute. The woman said, her eyes zeroing in on Hinata. Well I'll be damned. Seems that my little runt's got an admirer. And a main branch Hyugo even. What the hell are you talking about you psychotic bitch? Nalto yelled, apparently having recovered from his temporary fear. Shikamaru barely heard the noise of the throw and then he winced as the ringed end of a kunai bounced off Nalto's forehead protector silencing him. What disturbed him most was how the woman had not even glanced at Nalto. Anko it seemed was more interested in Hinata, even going so far as to move so that she was behind the girl with her arm draped around Hinata's shoulders. You know, like most men he's not particularly bright. If you ever want to get anywhere with him you really need to open up a little and learn how to use a woman's charms. Ayana. Hinata muttered blushing while rubbing her fingers together. Anko grinned wickedly and kissed the girl's cheek in a mocking fashion. Well we has to get going. Nalto follow me. Shikamaru, still stiff from shock watched as a grumbling Nalto and his sensei disappeared into the distance. It was then that he decided that being on a team with Chovi, Hinata and Asuma was not as troublesome as he thought even if he had to be the leader. Things could definitely be a lot worse. Anko smiled keeping a brisk pace up happy to see that Nalto was keeping up with her and that he had decided to forego bugging her about what she did earlier and instead start chattering away about what the border was like and other stupidities. Like what kind of people Dade has to fight. Will probably has to fight some missing nin s hired for the job, but it's no biggie. Anko gloated smugly, darting through the streets with Nalto keeping pace. You've beaten Kakashi so I doubt a bunch of lightweights are gonna stand much of a chance. Even if you are a bit of an idiot. Hey. Nalto shouted. Looking annoyed. I'm a ninja. Five minutes later they both came to an abrupt stop in front of the eastern gate, where Anko smiled brightly, glancing at him. Ready. This will be the first time we're actually going to work as a team too. Oi. How can you expect us to work as a team if we've never done it before? Nalto asked. Blinking in confusion. The best teamwork is the type that develops in battle. Just remember teamwork is fine. But if you rely on it you're doomed to fail. The Yondem didn't kill the QB with anyone's help. 
Anko responded her tone turning sing-song. So, ready for an awesome mission. Hell yay. Let's go. Nalto shouted. Needless to say the gate guards all shifted uncomfortably and shared looks of uneasiness. Nalto had never been beyond the walls of Kanoa, he had never thought about going further. The village was large enough and despite so many shinobi and civilians there were plenty of places for privacy. So taking that first step, beyond those gates had filled him with an immense sense of pride. Pride that he was a ninja, on a real mission. Anko had stared at him oddly for a moment, when he had darted around looking everywhere. When Nalto finally noticed she gave him an odd smirk, then continued on her way. After taking one long last look at the village walls and gate Nalto turned and ran to catch up with her. Sadly the novelty of travel wore off after the first 12 hours and as they approached the small village where their client was waiting Nalto was starting to feel impatient. He wanted things to hurry along to get this ambassador and the daimyo's daughter and get moving. He wanted to fight. His thoughts however were distracted from the images of his heroic deeds when Anko spoke up. Hey those guys are chasing a little girl. Nalto snapped his head around, almost tripping as he stared in the direction she was pointing. Squinting he was not sure, but it did appear that two men were chasing a small girl. He growled preparing to charge head first into the problem when Anko continued. Must be them. Anko mused glancing at him. Why don't you go get the girl for them? But minus Nalto started to protest until Anko glanced at him threateningly. Gulping he took off. Anko had long ago taught him that she was far from a pleasant person when questioned. He was not thrilled by the prospect of having to deal with a brat. Still, best to capture her now before Anko skinned him. Lifting his fingers he narrowed his eyes. Cave Bunshine. Seconds later he had five Naltos, who all reluctantly darted forward in a desperate attempt to grab the girl for the samurai. Amazingly she proved quite nimbly, avoiding all of their attempts at capture. Got you. One shouted making a mad dive only to slip, and skid past the girl, crashing into a couple of samurai. Damn it. Another shouted as he too made a dive, only to fall short and slam face first into the ground. No. Ugh. Get out of the way. Growling Nalto pushed the sleeves of his jacket up and made a mad dash for the child tackling her. She screamed at the assault as the momentum carried them both off their feet, with Nalto doing his best to shield the small girl as they rolled. Gotcha. Nalto said with a triumphant grin as they came to a stop. Seconds later the girl started biting and kicking. Eeyach. You stupid minus. Nalto shouted trying to free himself from the wild child. Thankfully he was rescued by one of the samurai his clone had toppled over, who reached down to lift up the girl up and tuck her under his arm. Recovering Nalto sat up glaring at the irate looking girl. These. Why me? Please excuse Ryoheim. She's a bit of a handful when surprised. The samurai dressed in red and black minus offered with a bow. I am Yoshi Naga. Thank you for helping us. Yay. You're welcome. Nalto muttered climbing to his feet, glaring at the red-headed girl who was glaring at him. The blonde boy stuck his tongue out, blowing a raspberry for the sheer principle of it. Naga-san please give Ryoheim to her maid. A man dressed in rather nice robes called from across the field, when Alto was annoyed to see Anko smiling sweetly at him. His annoyance turned to anger when the man continued, his voice brooking no argument. Also make sure that young man knows he is to stay at Ryoheim's side at all times. It appears that she shall be your responsibility. Naga said almost apologetically, handing over the disgruntled, looking girl to a harried maid who had arrived along with a palanquin. The maid bowed, muttering about the girl, being the death of her and then turned putting the small child into the palanquin. Nalto however felt his eye twitching as Ryo stuck her tongue out at him before the curtain of the palanquin closed. He could already feel it. He was going to punt her like a ball. Or strangle her. Or. Nalto, hurry up. We can't wait around all day for you. Anko called turning to continue on at the side of the ambassador and the twenty-some-odd samurai. Glaring at the woman it was all Nalto could do to keep from cursing out loud. Storming after the others he barely noticed the two samurai falling into step beside him, hands resting on their swords as he caught up to the palanquin and maid. Stupid Anko, stupid Ryo. Nalto grumbled under his breath, unable to believe that he would be babysitting. Chapter 5, Shinobi. Stupid brat. 
Nalto muttered under his breath glancing at Ryo, who was laughing while riding piggyback on Naga's shoulders. The little girl had escaped he palanquin shortly after they had started off, leading to yet another chase. Finally it was decided despite the protests of her maid, that it would be better if someone just carried her. Sighing Nalto shook his head forcing himself to forget about the two and turn his attention to the world around him. For a mission there really was not much of a difference from just wandering around the woods in Kanoa. Well minus having Anko actively hunting him. It was almost like a picnic, except for that annoying brat that kept turning around to stick a tongue out at him. Grumbling Nalto narrowed his eyes and darted past the samurai moving in to travel beside the ambassador himself. At least Anko was not going to skin him alive just for that. All this walking is pretty tiring isn't it? Blinking he looked at the man again, who was smiling faintly. Did you know this entire area was a battlefield about 50 years ago? Oh. No. Nalto offered blankly, wondering why the man would just start talking for no apparent reason. Really? I would have thought they would have taught the grass fire conflict in the academy. Hey, I slept most of the time. Nalto responded, scratching the back of his head. That was the first war to end with a non-aggression treaty between countries, so it was the first time that a shinobi village was not crushed. Teishi said, breezily glancing at Nalto. I have been meaning to ask, but what clan do you belong to? My clans are overrated. Nalto muttered. Oh. Teishi said, sounding uncomfortable now. Well, what are you going to do when you're older? I'm going to be hokage. Nalto said proudly. Really? Teishi looked at him appraisingly, then shrugged going to a different subject. So is there anything you'd like to talk about? Ho. Nalto blinked. I like talking on these type of trips. Teishi answered grinning. Part of why I am so good at my job. Well, I've been wondering. Why is the daimyo's daughter coming along? Nalto asked, giving the man an odd look. Ah. She is part of a diplomatic exchange. Teishi answered with a sigh. The only way to ensure that Grass will sign and follow the new non-aggression treaty is to exchange the fire daimyo's beloved daughter for one of the, the Grass daimyo's son. T that's horrible. Nalto said. Eyes wide in disbelief. How could anyone do that? What kind of father would do that? Nalto questioned loudly. A father that is determined to keep peace between the nations. Teishi answered calmly. Our military strength is unmatched with only wind and earth close enough to cause us problems. Sadly, we are an isolationist country, while the other countries has made interlocking alliances. But waterfall. Naga, who had hurried to catch up to Nalto, started to say only stop when the ambassador glanced at him. Waterfall is our only real ally. We rely on non-aggression treaties with the others, and the only way to ensure they are worth more than the paper they're written on is diplomatic exchange. Well that and the Great Wall of High No Cuny. B but. She's just a child. Nalto protested. This was not right. How could anyone think that using children as pawns was right? Isn't there another way? Nalto asked his voiced edge with his emotions. We could try to conquer the world. Teishi offered blandly. Glancing at him. We are not lightning however, so we prefer non-aggression treaties. It's still not right. Nalto muttered voice sounding almost scary. Oh. I agree. Teishi said lightly. Sadly like you Shinobi Ryoheim and myself are merely tools for a greater good. Nalto frowned slowing down this whole situation did not sit well with him. Plus, he did not like the idea of people being reduced to mere tools, especially him. Glancing at Teishi, Nalto scowled and continued on in silence. The little entourage surrounding the ambassador and Ryo reached one of the numerous gates of the massive Great Wall at noon where their progress slowed to a crawl. Anko had always hated this part of missions outside Fire Country it took forever to get through the various checkpoints and everybody was so damn formal. Glancing at Nalto she smirked seeing his obvious annoyance at their slow progress. There was something to be said to having a student with a personality like his. Turning her attention back to the wall, she noted the sharp upswing in the number of fire samurai guarding the gate. Thank the gods she did not have to go through more than one of these. Leading the group of samurai and the lone other ninja to the gate guards and Ko smiled faintly putting the samurai guards on edge. Apparently her reputation was known even among them. That made Ho smile just a bit more. Stopping just short of the towering wall, 
she glanced up at the distant watchtowers which were manned by squads of samurai, then turned back as the captain of the samurai came toward her. Unconcerned Anko fished in her pocket and then producing the required papers handed it over, whistling as she motioned Penalto to join her. The blonde, shooting a dark glare at Ryo, darted up to join her side. He did not say anything and Anko did nothing to acknowledge his presence. The captain glanced at them briefly, checked the papers and then started toward the samurai. These come on. Can't we like just go over the wall or something? Nalto whined crossing his arms 20 minutes later, as they watched the captain continue checking the samurai against the list. If we were alone then yeah, but we're not and besides there are too many samurai around. Anko said conversationally. The fire country has roughly 340,000 samurai, a large portion of which patrol these walls. But. We could get past them right. They're just samurai. Nalto grumbled. Moron. Anko muttered crossing her own arms. The captains and commanders are failed genin, even those born into the life of a samurai have some experience with using and detecting chakra. The elite samurai that guard the daimyo are even former jonin. Failed genin. Nalto said blankly. I thought when you failed you were sent back to the academy. Now. That'd be a waste of talent. Those that fail are shunted off into samurai training, along with those that fail the smaller academies in various Fire Nation villages. Anko glanced at him, noting his confusion. Now you know why Fire Country has such an overwhelming military power our samurai can mold and use chakra and our ninja are better trained than everybody else. Nalto muttered something and Anko laughed before heading toward Teishi, who was talking with the samurai captain. They went quiet at her approach and she made a mental note at that, even though she pretended he didn't notice anything. So. You done yet, or do we need to set up camp here for the night? Everything is in order. The captain bristled slightly, handing the ambassador a sealed scroll. Shinta-san asks that you give this to the grass daimyo it confirms details about the amount of samurai he will be allowed to bring to the tune-in exams. Well. If that's everything we'll be going. Naruto's getting antsy. The samurai captain nodded faintly muttering something about typical ninja and then waved to the gates to be opened. Turning he stared at her intently. One of your unboo captains alerted us to the fact that there are two dozen missing nins out there. Really? Where at? Anko asked her eyes growing cold. They did not provide us with any specifics. The captain answered. I think you should take more samurai two dozen is far too many ninja for just the two of you and a half dozen samurai. Now, we can handle it. Anko grinned turning to the ambassador. Well, let's get it in gear. Turning she stared at Nalto and cupped her hands around her mouth. Hey runt. You've got point start walking. What? Nalto shouted back. Anko bit back her annoyance. I said walk you damn moron. Nalto mumbled something and then turning started walking. Anko offered a vaunty wave at the samurai captain, and then motioned to the group to follow the blonde. Nalto led the way through the gate, then down the slight hill, past the open ground and across the far bridge. Anko whistled happily from the rear of the group, she could not wait to be back in the thick of battle. That was a joy she missed dearly. High Plains Brass Country. Nalto glared at the simmering fire, rotating his almost charred fish without thinking. He was perfectly aware that more than a few of the Fire Nation samurai were glaring at him, but he did not care. How many of them had to spend three weeks babysitting a child that should have been locked in a cage? Snorting he yanked his, now completely black, fish out of the fire and glared at it before tossing it away. Screw it all to hell, as far as Nalto was concerned this mission was a total bust. The only fights he'd had were with Ryo. And according to both Anko and Teishi, they would meet up with the Kusa escort sometime tomorrow. Still he tried to comfort himself that at least he was out on a mission now. It might have been a total pile of crap. But at least it was a mission not more training. Propping his chin in his hands he glowered at the flames, his mind roaming to the fact that this was his first birthday outside of Kanoa. Not that it really was different, outside of Oka offering a happy birthday bowl of Ram Nalto had never celebrated or received anything. It had not however kept him from hurting bad enough yesterday, that he had almost mentioned it to Anko, thankfully he had remembered that Anko was the last person that would actually care about his birth. These, you look like you've lost your best friend. Anko grinned as she plopped down next to Nalto, picking up a stick to poke the fire. Snorting the blonde ignored her, unwilling to say anything to her about what he was feeling. 
Anko was quiet for several long minutes, and then continued as if they had always been talking about the fire slash grass conflict. Did you know that the real reason, fire and grass had any sort of problems was because of an underwater lake? And I care. Nalto deadpan staring at the woman. Whatever just get your ass to the forest, Anko said waving a hand annoyed. We're going to do some extra training, while we have the time. More training. Nalto protested glaring at her. Did I stutter? Anko asked casually, standing up while glaring at him. Believe it or not runt, we're a team and I really don't want to has to train someone new. Reaching into the pocket of her coast, she dropped what appeared to be a thick roll of bandages at Nalto's feet. What's that? Nalto asked, not moving to touch the item. He had learned in his month, long training with Hoho that if he was not careful he could fall head first into a trap and would suffer horribly for it. Kami knows how many times, he had fallen into one of Ho traps during a sparring session. A forearm holster to your kunai. Anko answered blandly, crossing her arms. I figured you were about ready for one. Scowling Nalto picked up the item and unrolled it, discovering several thinner than normal kunai. It took some serious consideration on his part and then Nalto decided that they would probably fall into his hand if he wanted them to. Frowning he rolled up his sleeve and struggled with the item before looking up at Anko. So how do I use it? Rolling her eyes Anko turned away from him. Tense your arm for a minute and one will fall into your hand. Thanks Anko. Nalto said happily after a moment, knowing it was not a birthday present, but he could pretend. It was all Nalto really had besides it did show that Anko did care a bit about his safety. Even he could see how useful a forearm holster could be. Oh, that's the only birthday present you'll ever get from me. Anko said dismissively before she started walking toward the forest. Nalto sat there for a moment. A strange feeling stirring in his chest. Blinking away the tears of joy from someone, other than Oka actually acknowledging his birth before he darted off the log falling into step beside Anko. Maybe some extra training would not be so bad. Okay. Anko chirped happily, standing in front of a decent-sized pond. Seeing she had Nalto's attention she continued. Since Ambassador Taishi insisted on a stop for the day, I decided we're still going to train. This time we're doing something different, so training's going to be really fun today. Nalto groaned prompting Anko to smile brightly. We'll be working on chakra control Anko continued leaping into the air, with a twisting back flip before landing in a graceful crouch in the center of the pond. Since they had already covered tree climbing, Anko saw no reason to put this off. Especially since they had passed through the checkpoint in the Great Wall and entered the grass country not too long ago. Sadly the only way to get him interested in learning this would be showing off. Not that Anko really had a problem with that. Wow www. Nalto shouted, hands coming up in front of him. Right. Now then I want you to walk out here to me. Anko shouted, sweeping her hand out in front of her. Walk on water. Nalto questioned, loudly before scowling at her. Lucky for him Anko was not like her sensor, otherwise Nalto would have been dead as of now. Just concentrate your chakra under your feet, that's all it takes. Just expel a constant amount and you'll be fine. I chach. Nalto scratched the back of his head scowling. Anko saw the way he was staring at her through half-closed eyes and groaned she knew that face, it was his I'm thinking cause I am confused but I am not telling you look. Anko frowned even going so far as to tap her foot on the water. He now had yet another mark in her going to kill while sleeping column. He seemed to notice her impatience and snorted, thumbing his nose. Piece of cake. That said he took off on a dead run. Sadly he managed four steps before he sunk all the way up to his neck. I thought it was going to be a piece of cake. Anko taunted. Screw you. Nalto shouted angrily before struggling his way back to shore pulling his jacket off angrily and tossing it aside. Scowling he closed his eyes, hands coming up as he concentrated. Then without warning he opened his eyes and tried running yet again. Cursing loudly Nalto splashed face first into the pond, displacing a few fish. Pushing and spluttering his way upright he glared at Anko before returning to shore. Anko shook her head, rubbing her temples. This was going to be a long day. Taking a breath, he attempted to banish everything to concentrate on what he had to do. First he had to mold his chakra, yet again. He was beginning to doubt just how much chakra he could possibly have. 
Still he had to mold it first, and like in the academy it did so sluggishly. Then it sped up, flowing more fluidly like it was supposed to. Satisfied with that, he took a deeper breath taking a moment to enjoy the way the tufts of his hair danced with the breeze and the sun warmed his neck. As calm as he could be, Nalto turned back to his chakra concentrating it on his feet and took an uncertain step, easing his weight onto the water. When it seemed he was not about to sink he brought his other foot forward only to fall face first into the pond water. Sputtering he pushed his way upright and ranted, while a fish thrashed in his hair before escaping. Frustrated beyond belief Nalto summed up his feelings in one word. Damn. Give it a rest Nalto. Anko called not looking up from her spot near a tree where she was busy arranging odd looking items. Besides, I need to see you for a minute. Grumbling Nalto trudged out of the water and dripping, wet stomped his way to her side where she motioned to him to sit down without looking up. Scowling he swept his gaze over the items she had two kunai two vials of dark ink, which she was mixing up, and two odd looking crystals. Looking up at her he frowned. Oh. What's going on? Anko didn't respond for a moment, then set her ink down and selected a kunai handing it to him. I need some of your blood, prick your thumb or something. Uh -uh. Okay. Nalto said slowly, not really knowing what was going on with her, but having learned it was best not to question her. Pricking his thumb he winced and offered it to her. Instead she took the kunai and dipped it into the second vial of ink. Nalto blinked, then started sucking on his thumb annoyance bubbling up inside him. What the hell was going on? Why exactly did she need his blood? He did however watch in fascination, as she finally picked up one of the brushes and dipping it in the ink started inking a design into the back of her wrist. This is called the emblem of power, Anko said casually, not looking up from her work of intricate lines. It's part of a binding system used by Unbu and Hunter Nin S. Looking up she dipped her brush again, her tone serious. It's used primarily for keeping track of team members, so that even if the team fragments and someone runs into a serious problem, but are unable to radio the help the others can know. Oh. How does that work? Like, oh, reading each other's minds. No, Anko said looking back at her wrist and finishing it off. Then picking up one of the crystals, he inked almost invisible candy on it before setting it back down and picking up the other vial of ink, and a clean brush that held his blood. It functions off emotions. The idea of the jutsu is simply to establish a link that increases the sensitivity of the two bound people to these sort of projected slash sensed emotions. Ho. Nalto blinked watching, as she inked the other crystal first before motioning for him to turn around. Warily he shifted around so that she could have access to the back of his neck where she started inking another seal. This one is called the emblem of truth. Anko said casually, taking her sweet time. Now this binding jutsu does has a few limitations. Mostly that the further we are from each other, the weaker it gets. Still it's very handy to have. The crystals resonate with chakra and emotions, so they're like emotional radios. And of course sometimes those limitations can be advantageous. As you follow a path toward the person you are bound with the jutsu gets stronger making it easy to track them so long as their emotions are not fluctuating too much. Oh. I get it. Nalto lied turning when Anko finished up with the design on his neck. So, you invented this? No, Anko said, scowling faintly as she picked up the two kunai. My sensei and Freya-sama did, they were two of the sanin and created quite a few justice that are still used by Unbu and Kanoa Hunter Nines. Why do you say sensei like that? Nalto asked after a moment watching as she mixed, the blood on the two blades. I mean, it sounds like you hate him or something. It's none of your business. Anko said in a clipped tone, her eyes boring into him. All you need to know is my sensor was one of the Sanin, those three legendary ninja that were trained personally by the Sandame Hokage. Wow. So where are they now? Nalto asked excitedly, he hadn't known that the old man had taught legendary ninja. Mostly though it was the fact that he was under the tutelage of one of these famous ninja's own students. Sensei is on a quest, Freya-sama is busy on an extended mission and Sunaid sama retired. Anko said briskly, finally applying the mixed blood to both crystals before looking up at him. Now turn your ass back around, so we can finish this binding jutsu, and you can get back to your training. Snorting Nalto did as ordered, shivering when he felt her cool fingers press an even cooler stone, against his neck where the design had been placed. Kinbaki. 
At first Nalto felt a slight warmth up crawl up his spine, then it grew too uncomfortable heat. Then suddenly there was a flash of intense heat, and he collapsed forward, eyes crossed in pain. Kinbaki. Anko said once more and, Nalto heard a faint grunt of pain. The burning sensation grew to a peak where it felt, as if the back of his neck was peeling away and then. It died. The burning was replaced for a brief moment, by a string of odd emotions, and then they were snuffed out just as suddenly as the burning. Puzzled over that Nalto reached back to touch his throbbing neck, expecting to feel burnt flesh, or at least the crystal. Instead all he felt was smooth flesh as if nothing had ever happened. Turning he found Anko almost sluggishly pushing herself upright. Hey, hey. Are you okay? Nalto asked anxiously, only to receive an odd look from the older woman. What if the justie had backfired and her mind was scrambled or something? Her look grew even odder and then her entire face went back to that smug expression she normally wore. I'm fine. You get back to work, you've had enough of a break runt. Nalto bristled at that then snorting climbed to his feet and stormed back toward the pond, swearing that would be the last time he ever worried to that bitch. Turning he prepared an insult, but found the woman already cleaning up and standing not even paying him the slightest bit of attention. Annoyed he turned back to the pond and closed his eyes molding Chakra once more. He would not give up until he walked on this water like that psycho bitch Anko had. What had even possessed her to even put him through this? Seconds later he was drenched once more and cursing loudly as he yanked off his shirt throwing it on top of his jacket. He was not going to give up until he had this mastered. Munching on her dango quietly Anko watched as the last traces of day disappeared. The stars were quick to appear, attempting to give the world a semi-balance of light. Not that the camp needed it. In the center of the tents was a fire, pit where a fire crackled happily. It was almost like an idyllic family outing, except for the fact that there were several highly trained samurai, and one of the most sadistic women on the planet on guard duty. Anko smirked, selecting another dango from her cart and scanning the area. There was still no sign of those missing nins, still. She would not give up on them yet. They were not incredible strong from what she could tell, maybe low tune-in level at most, so she was not worried that Nalto could not handle the fight. Speaking of Nalto she narrowed her eyes wondering why he was still training. Well, besides the fact that she had told him to keep training. He should have stopped a long time ago, yet the link was resonating with frustration a sure sign that he was training. Scowling Anko finished her dango, she had better go check on the runt. Grumbling she left her comfortable spot in the shadow of a tree, moving silently through the woods until she reached the edge of the pond she'd found early and started the training. Carefully in case there were enemies about, she parted the branches of the tree in front of her. There bathed in moon and starlight was Nalto stripped down to his underwear and still trying to master the water walking technique. Frowning Anko shifted to a better position struggling to see his face. His eyes almost seemed to glow even as he continued to fall into the water, but his body seemed to be moving sluggishly. By all rights the boy should have collapsed by now due to exhaustion even with his inhuman stamina. He had been training non-stop for nearly 12 hours, that was insane. Still Anko left him alone, almost willing him to get this technique, because like she had told him earlier he was her teammate. Anko watched seeing the way he would manage to stumble through the water knee deep before toppling forward to sink. A curse managed to escape her as she started to save his damn hide, only freeze when his head broke the surface and he uttered a curse of his own. Settling back she watched as he swam back to shore where he shook his head and hopped on one foot to knock water out of his ear. Turning Nalto glared at the pond, eyes more determined than ever. Damn it. I'm going to be hooked someday. I can do this. I'm not going to let a freaking pond stop me. That declared he concentrated, hands held in position to help the concentration needed to mold the chakra. Anko held her breath on an instinctive level she knew that this would be his last shot. Either he made it, or he passed out, and she had to save his worthless ass. Lowering his hands Nalto marched forward, head held high as if he was not even worried. Anko bit her lip watching as his feet carried him further and further across the water's surface and then pride filling her for some reason, she smirked as he came to a stop dead center. The sheer amount of stamina and chakra he was using was outrageous impossible, yet there he was, and he even appeared to have chakra and stamina left to burn. Nalto looked around smugly, then lifted his arm's voice echoing in the night. Thought I could not do it didn't hear stupid sadistic bitch. I'm going to be hooked and you can't stop me. 
Nut shouted he started dancing stupidly, cheering himself. And Co merely continued to stare at him, a blank look on her face. Not so much because of his dance but more, because of the fact that he had the energy to dance. Anybody else herself included, would have collapsed well before they could even think about dancing. Just what was Nalto? How strong could he become how powerful? Somewhere, unknown to, her a smaller voice that sounded vaguely like a hissing snake, whispered how can I use him? Still even Nalto could not fight off exhaustion forever as he toppled forward once more, sinking yet again. Anko waited a few minutes to ensure that he was not about to recover, and then she broke cover to retrieve Nalto and keep him in the world of the living. Nalto woke up with a dull throb in his temples, he was not sure why, but he knew that he had one and that the noise around him was not helping. Sitting up, the blonde looked around as the samurai packed up the camp, too playing with Ryo who was laughing happily. Groaning Nalto climbed to his feet, hand resting against one of his temples. About time you woke up. Anko suddenly said from behind him, and Nalto jerked in surprise. These, why did she always do that? Turning he glared up at the smiling Jonin, who was twirling a kunai. Well, I guess we can start now. Unless your highness would like to sleep a bit more. Nalto glared at her and she smiled ruffling his hair before turning to speak with a samurai that was nearby. Snorting the blonde looked at the sky to see how long he had been sleeping but found it a flat grey colour. Oh just the perfect way to start a day under a grey sky and with a throbbing headache. All he needed now was to find out he was on the same damn team with Sasuke after all. I'd have to kill myself, if that was true. Nalto muttered as he turned back to his sleeping bag, repacking it. Naga. Naga. Look. Ryo suddenly shouted drawing Nalto's attention. He watched as the girl darted away from the smiling samurai to grab a sunflower on the edge of the camp. She was smiling brightly, pleased with the discovery. Even Nalto started to smile at that then three things happened at once. Anko shouted ambush, a samurai that was standing beside Nalto was brought down with a kunai to the throat, and Naga was unsheathing his sword racing to save Ryo from the various missing nins that were hurtling toward them. Move. Anko shouted as samurai fanned out in a circle to protect the ambassador. Nalto's eyes darted everywhere Naga was fighting desperately against a missing nin Anko was darting everywhere, leaving a bloody wake behind her with a grin. The samurai next to him was dead, his blood pooling around Nalto's feet, those glassy eyes staring unseeing at the heavens. Nalto knew he should do something to move to fight. Yet he could not do it. His body refused to move. He watched a samurai, who were only just barely able to mold chakra fought against seemingly unbeatable ninja. He saw samurai die horrible, painful deaths at the hands of ninja and tutsu. Ryo was screaming, as Naga collapsed to his knees blood spraying from his throat. The blood kept pooling, expanding, until Nalto's foot was slick with the liquid. He felt sick, he wanted to run away. Then something inside Nalto stirred, it was not like during his fight with Sasuke or sparring Anko. It was almost as if something inside him was dancing. He felt his blood starting to burn with a desire to draw blood to. 2. Nalto saw Naga, clutch futile at his murderer's clothes and Ryo screamed, as she tried to crawl away from the towering ninja that had killed her only source of protection. Suddenly everything that had frozen him in place was gone. Scattered like leaves during a whirlwind. Nalto reacted without thinking, darting forward as the missing nin started flashing through seals for a futsu. Nalto's hand shot to his leg holster before sending several kunai flying almost flawlessly. Nalto was seconds behind the weapons, eyes narrowed and instincts guiding him. The missing nin cursed as he leapt out of the path of the weapons, turning to stare at Nalto. Nalto stared at those grey eyes, even as things starting slowing down. A part of him shouted that he was going to die while another part, the part that had taken control screamed wordlessly in anticipation of the fight. Cave Bunshine. Seconds later Nalto was surrounded by four clones, two ducked the missing nin's initial attack to grab Ryo and fled toward the ambassador. The other two disappeared in a flash of smoke but they had bought Nalto enough time to close the minor gap, bringing him into striking distance. The missing nin took a swipe at the boy's head with a kunai, but Nalto ducked coming up thrusting his own kunai to the man's stomach. Instinct was all Nalto had right now and he was running with it, this bastard was going to try and hurt Ryo after all and Nalto could not let that happen. The missing nin reacted instantly, taking a half step back while performing a passing block forcing Nalto's weapon into the earth. 
Naruto adapted to the sudden change smoothly, using his momentum to whip around into a single-handed handstand catching the missing Nin's hand that was holding a kunai aimed at Naruto's neck. There was a half second of non-movement, then Naruto was delivering an inverted front kick to the man's elbow. The missing Nin yanked his arm away, clutching at the now broke joint as Naruto completed his flip, pulling his kunai free. Spinning Naruto's moment of joy at his great move was brought to an abrupt halt when the missing Nin attacked with his other arm viciously. Naruto managed to move to the side just as the kunai came within inches of slicing his cheek. Gulping Naruto tried to recover but was forced to dodge yet again, with a handspring just barely avoiding the stab at his chest. This was bad. He could not dodge for much longer. This was proven a moment later when the missing Nin's kunai stabbed through the sleeve of Naruto jumpsuit, slicing his shoulder. Clutching his arm he tumbled to the ground, but thankfully his training paid off and he rolled in a desperate attempt to put some space between them. Damn it. Skidding to a stop, Nalto looked around eyes going wide realizing that the missing Nin was already within a half step of him. Heaving he moved his body forcing himself into a half crouch only to be pitched forward, and pelted by debris as an flash note that had escaped his weapon's pouch went off. Recovering quickly Nalto instinctively turned to face his enemy while blocking out the pain of his shoulder. The missing Nin was crouched hand over his eyes as if shielding them. Once more following his instincts Nalto charged his enemy empty-handed. The missing Nin apparently heard his rush and made a blind lunge at Nalto's chest, but the blonde jumped like he had been taught flipping over the man as he twisted around in the air. What followed next was slow, almost dreamlike. Nalto saw the opening and his hand moved of its own accord allowing a kunai from his forearm holster to fall perfectly into his hand. The moment it left his fingers, Nalto no longer saw an enemy or a human. All Nalto saw was a training dummy. Then time sped back up and he was slamming full force into the ground while his enemy collapsed face first. For a moment Nalto felt pride that he had hit the target, that he had preformed so perfectly it did not register the several long minutes that he was on a mission and that was a real human he had just killed. His mind refused to accept the facts until he could no longer ignore the blood that had splattered his face from the blow. Numbness spread through him and then. Tears. Anko ducked a first wild slash, catching it on her way back to a standing position. For a moment she stared into the widening eyes of the missing ninja she was fighting, and then she was molding her chakra. Sonata Vashu. Seconds later Anko grimaced, as snakes exploded from the sleeve of her jacket twisting as the plunge through the air to sink their generous fangs into the unsuspecting ninja. She watched briefly as his mouth foamed and then released his arm the snakes recoiling back into her wrist. Noticing that she was being avoided for the moment she took the chance to study the battlefield, she had not expected an ambush here. Stupid. She should have seen it coming, should have felt the morons moving into position. At least the samurai were talented enough with chakra that they could stall the attacking ninja. Ducking a sloppy attack Anko plunged a kunai through the missing nin's ribs and into his heart. Shutting him away Anko spun realizing that she could not see or feel Nalto at all. Where was that brat? Earlier in the fight, she had seen him frozen, but he had been alive. Now she could not feel anything yet he had not died, if he had Anko would have felt that. She had taken only a few dozen steps when another missing nin charged her, Anko reacted, easily using his weight and momentum. Twisting as he passed she plunged a kunai into his spine, severing his motor function but leaving him alive. In extreme pain. But alive. Turning she started forward once more only to stop in her track seeing Nalto duck a swing from the missing nin, then rise thrusting a kunai toward the man's stomach. Earth release. Earth shore return. Anko reacted to the shout. Leaping back in time to see the ground she had been standing on churn before turning into a wall of stone. Landing once more she narrowed her eyes, watching as the missing nin responsible exploded from behind the wall. Strange. Anko scowled as the man made a lunge toward her, dodging and twisting around his blows, her mind raced paying attention to the various jutsus she had heard so far. Dodging yet another earth jutsu she landed her scowl in full force. The stone did not allow ninja to go missing this many missing nins using stone jutsus just did not make any sense. You are a quick one. The man said, eyes narrowing even as his hands started flashing through a series of seals. Anko smiled viciously, molding her chakra and lashing out with a punch Sonata Vashu. Seconds later she watched as the man, obviously at least Lo Jonin, lost his concentration as several snakes wrapped around them with bone-crushing power. 
Turning her gaze away as the snakes finished their work she tried to find Nalto again, cursing that she had lost track of the fight. Moving quickly she dumped up, using the stone wall as a perch to locate the fight she was interested in, which she found just as a flash note went off. Cursing she squinted through the dots in front of her eyes, her breath stopping as Nalto twisted around to a head on charge. Would he? Anko felt her eyes widened as she saw Nalto at twelve, make one of the most beautiful kills she had ever seen. The blinded missing Nin made a lunge for his chest but Nalto had jumped, twisting in the air. Anko could almost read his mind as his eyes fixated on the back of the man's neck she bit her lip watching as his hand came forward, his forearm holster supplying the kunai required. After that it was nothing more than a flash of dark metal slipping perfectly from his hand and into the base of the man's skull. Anko saw a vague, satisfied smile on Nalto's face before he crashed to the earth, his enemy toppling forward from the momentum. It was all over. Seconds stretched out in silence and Anko shifted her attention briefly to the ambassador noting that most of the samurai were wounded in some way. Thankfully the missing nins were retreating, which meant she could turn her attention back to Nalto. Nalto had yet to move and his emotions were not registering. No, they were starting to come through now. He felt guilty. Scowling Anko hopped off the wall and stepping over the bodies of various samurai, and ninja made her way to Nalto. Curious she paused next to the ninja that Nalto had taken down kneeling she studied his body fingers prodding his shoulders and back. Hmm. About the same strength as Sasu. Grinning in satisfaction she plucked the kunai from the man's skull and stood walking over to kneel next to Nalto. He was spread eagle on the ground blue eyes staring at the sky as he cried, the type of crying that only those who were too innocent for life as a ninja. It was a silent cry, the type that so often followed first kills. Staring at him, she remembered. Kill them, Anko. My sweet little viper. A shadowy man with yellow eyes whispered to her before glancing at her two happily chatting teammates. Ha, Oro Sensor. Shaking that memory off she reached down gently wiping Nalto's cheek clear of tears. Her stomach was twisting itself into a knot, but she could not place a finger on why. Aye aye. Nalto hiccuped, his eyes drifting to stare at her. Anko nodded, giving him a reassuring smile. It was beautiful. Then reaching down she pressed the kunai into his hand. This is yours. She hesitated feeling, as if she had heard those things somewhere before. Anko quickly shrugged that off noticing his shoulder. The wound was deep. But it seemed to be healing on its own. Raising an eyebrow she produced a bandage and covered the wound not bothering with the medical cream. Odd. She knew he recovered quickly but this was faster than she had ever seen. I killed him. Nalto whispered hoarsely, breaking her train of thought. Turning her attention back to him, she found him staring at her, as if waiting for her judgment. Anko nodded glancing back at him with a proud smile. I'll buy you ramen when we get to the hidden grass. Standing she moved off to check on the others, granting him a moment to recover from the shock of his first kill. Then suddenly she realized with a horrible vault that everything she had just said and done, had been said to her. Her hand went up to her neck, covering a blank space where she remembered being bitten once. She was not her censor. She was not. Chapter 6. Kusa Village. Sandane could feel a stiffness in his joints as he watched the warm rain bead against the windows of his office as he listened to its steady drum beat on the roof. He was getting old. He even had doubts about his ability to bear the responsibilities of Hokiv much longer. Just yesterday he had forgotten an important meeting with Ibikai, the head of his Unbu interrogation squad all, because he had allowed himself to become distracted staring at flowers. A hokage should be like a Roman candle. A long, powerful ascent and then, when it reaches the peak, an unrivaled explosion. Sunday muttered softly recalling the Nidame's words. Maybe he should select another hokage and retire yet again. But who? The closest candidate in terms of power was Kikashi but that man could not be Hokid. If only one of his students was still around, then he could select one. Without meaning to he started to remember the days, when he was young and teaching the famous Sanins. He was startled out of his reminiscence, by a soft, knocking at the office door. Come in. Old though he was Sandame could tell by the way the person's footsteps fell that they were Unbu. They had a very unique way of moving that only a truly experienced ninja like a cave could notice. Turning he stared at the man taking in the typical black uniform and armor, noting the katana strapped to his back. 
Although the Unbu looked familiar, the Sandane could swear he even remembered holding the man as a baby a long, long time ago. He racked his brain to remember the name that accompanied the face behind the bird mask. Try as he might, he could not remember, so instead the Sandame sighed, inquiring, What is it? Reports. That said, the man offered the two tiny, eaten silver cylinders. Sandame untied the cylinders and took them over to the light of the window, opening to examine the minute seals. One was the familiar seal of Kakashi. Breaking it open the message inside was short and encrypted with only a basic cipher that the Sandane was able read directly. It reported that Anko's team had completed their mission successfully and would return soon. The other cylinder took him a minute to recognize before he blinked. Anko. That will be all. Sandane said without making a move to open her cylinder. The second the door was shut he returned to his seat behind his desk and sat down the cylinder still in hand. Setting it aside for a moment, he poured himself a cup of strong and bitter tea then sipped listening to the rain. What could have caused Anko to send him a report immediately from the field by way of Unbu? She never did that, even when there were things that warranted such action. Sighing he broke the seals and found four scrolls, made of very thin paper, the characters tiny the message long and encoded in Unbu cipher reserved to the most sensitive communications. Decoding was laborious. When it was completed, he read the report and then reread it twice. Putting the report down on his desk he allowed his eyes to drift back to the beads of water on the window pane as he let his mind range. Kotetsu. Sandane called and was immediately greeted with the bandaged tune-in. Hokid-sama. As soon as the rain stops, fetch Kakashi-san and alert the chief medic at the hospital to prepare for a class A examination within a week. How? Kotetsu said, rushing out of the room, closing the door behind him. Smiling Sandame looked down at report from Anko once more. For the first time in a long while he felt a shiver of what could almost be called youthful excitement run through his old body. I knew there was something about that boy. It was beautiful. Nalto muttered to himself as he leaned against the boulder, his fingers splayed against the yellowed grass. They were located in an area that Anko had called the High Plains, once a battlefield from the grass fire conflict. When Anko had told him the story of the place Nalto had not cared, he had been lost in thought about the man he had killed. Somehow, he just could not make himself care about anything. He had not meant to kill the man Nalto had almost shouted that at her, but Anko's obvious pride had kept him from it. Her pride made him try to lock away his feelings about the murder. But somehow, whenever he closed his eyes, or allowed his mind to wander images of his own hands stained with someone else's blood, crept into his mind. Momentarily clenching his eyes and teeth he forcibly dispelled these visions. He was a ninja and it had been beautiful. Nodding Nalto focused his attention back on the little girl that was playing with two of his clones. She seemed so happy rough housing with his clones and laughing. He watched, trying to take some enjoyment in the little girl's joy. Failing Nalto shifted his gaze to Anko, who was talking with the ambassador, her body language suggesting what they were discussing was serious. Closing his eyes he leaned his head against the boulder, concentrating on his breathing. This proved to be a bad idea, since he was bombarded with memories of the samurai that had died, watching Nago die of the blood spraying from the back of the missing Nin's head. Snapping his eyes open he found himself staring up into the curious gaze of Ryo. Aruto. Oh. Yeah. Nalto managed, blinking. Smiling shyly the little girl held up a flower for him. Fou. Ho. Nalto managed, reaching up to take the flower curiously. Looking back at her he smiled back, nobody had ever given him a flower before. Thanks Ryo-chan. The girl giggled then turned and ran back off to play with the clones, one of whom picked her up and spun her around laughing. Nalto watched for a moment, then felt queasy and looked back at the flower. How could she be so happy? How could he stand to hold such a delicate little flower in the same hands that he had used to brutally take a human life? Nalto. Dirking the blonde looked up to see Anko glaring at him. Getting up quickly he put the flower in a pocket rushing over to her. Arms crossed she stared at him before speaking once more. The ambassador says our grass contacts will be arriving soon, you need to make sure to keep a very close eye on Ryo. Right. Nato said. Looking as serious as he could make himself. Strangely, now that he had something to concentrate on other than the life he had taken the pain lessened. Maybe that was the secret to why Anko was always on the move, always toying with a kunai or other weapon. Turning he motioned his clones, 
one of whom was letting Ryo ride on his back, to join him. Taking the girl and allowing the two clones to disappear in a puff he offered a goofy smile. Piggyback ride. Yay. Ryo cheered happily as Nalto awkwardly put the girl on his shoulders. He even bore the child's playful pulling on his hair, allowing a facade of his former carefree nature to slid into place. He couldn't afford to let Anko down. So he'd play a game of pretend. And Nalto was great at pretending. Anko hated grass country. Not the politics, not the ninja, but the country. The seemingly endless sea of grass, the metallic water, the oppressive expanse of sky. Grass country was the perfect home for snakes. Arakamal had been fond of it, reminding her often how much the right conditions were required to cultivate beautiful things. Anko sighed, thinking back to her former sensor. Arakamal had an affinity for beautiful things though most would consider the aesthetic he judged with rather twisted, in it beauty and death were always intimately intertwined. Thus it was not surprising that some of the most deadly species of snake she knew of had originated in the grass. Many of these snakes, even as hatchlings, had the power to kill a grown man with only a few ounces of genome striking swiftly and without warning. Scowling Anko brought her attention back to the group around her. A few hours ago, they had been met by a large team of grass ninja who were to escort them to Kusa village. These ninja seemed competent enough, although a brief exhibition of killer intent had been necessary when one of the older males had leered at her to convince them to behave themselves. She would have loved to kill the bastard then, but as this was a diplomatic mission some restraint was required. It had bothered her a little that she could not indiscriminately kill the Kusa ninja. That was passing though. What weighed her mind at the moment was Nalto. Since performing the Kinbaku no Jutsu she had been training herself with it so that she could better keep track of the brat. It still took some concentration to pick up the faint emotional signals, but generally it worked quite well. Arguably too well. Ever since his kill the blonde had been a tumult of emotions. She could feel the part of him that was repulsed and remorseful for what he had done yet she also sensed how his heart was hardening to the reality. Unbidden these emotions from the boy brought back memories of a young girl whose own hands were stained with blood. Like Nalto her first kill had been a reaction without thought, instinct. At first she too had been remorseful, but soon with the encouragement of her sensor she had learned to revel in the experience. Looking over at Nalto she wondered if the same would happen to him. A shiver ran down her spine as the similarities between her and former sensor became apparent. Damn it though what the hell was she supposed to do? She hated Orokamal and what he had done to her, but she could only train Nalto how she had been trained. Yet creating another monster, honoring her former sensor by passing on his ideals in addition to his techniques. Would she allow that? At least she had realized it before she tried to teach him any of the forbidden techniques that she knew. While he could, theoretically learn them they required totally embracing a willingness to kill. Nalto could never truly embrace that aspect unless she was willing to force it like Orokamal had done to her. And she refused to do that. So her various technique news from her former teacher were off limits. Damn it. Crossing her arms she scowled, shifting her attention back to more important matters, namely the information she had gleaned from her interrogation of the missing nin she had spared. It had been truly enlightening. Anko could not help but smile to herself, it looked like she would not have to leave Kusa without assassinating someone, after all. Oda Hidelori. Anko remembered meeting the man once, he was some sort of judge, or some mildly important official in the grass daimyo's court. Normally for this sort of kill, she would prefer to as some backup, inevitably good moles had more power than they revealed but she would make do. Besides Nalto was a half-decent ninja, or at least he was on his way to it. Shifting her gaze from the distance, she glanced at the blonde who was carrying Ryo, who had abandoned her palanquin in favor of his back much to her maid's distress minus and talking with an older Kusa ninja. Scowling she looked at the ninja that had joined her, he was roughly Nalto's age, but seemed a little different. For one thing he was not wearing the standard straw, hat, or the unisex uniforms. The boy was dressed in an official kimono, but he wore a kusa forehead protector. He seemed a bit harsher than most ninja his age. Excuse me but is there any particular reason you're staring at me? The boy asked, suddenly, not looking away from the horizon. I'm just picturing what you'd look like bald. Anko retorted noting how he did not flinch at the comment. So do you has a name? You Tagabukai Noga. The boy said, turning his attention to her. So you are a Jonin from Kanoa. Yep. 
One of the best they got. Anko chirped, studying him without making it obvious. And him. Noga said casually gesturing behind him. Who? Anko said, turning to stare at the group. Then the obviousness of the question hit her and she chuckled. Nalto. Now, he's just a genin. I see. He's strong though. Got this huge dream of being hokid that drives him. Anko said conversationally, turning back to stare at the horizon. So he wants to be hokid. Noga muttered turning back to study Nalto before facing forward once more. Anko frowned to the extent that she could tell the boy was nothing dangerous in terms of chakra capacity and from his motions and the way he held himself she guessed that he had not been a ninja for more than a year or so and yet. He reminded Ho vaguely of her former sensor. What's Kusa village like? Nalto asked glancing at the grass ninja at his side while Ryo stumbled along holding his hand. It's like any other hidden village. The nin answered blandly. That's really helpful. Nalto muttered, before sticking his tongue out at the man. Are you really going to become Hokid? The samurai on his right suddenly asked and Nalto could not help, but plaster a wide grin on his face. Yep. The greatest Hokid ever. The samurai was silent for a moment, then he raised an eyebrow. Can you really do it though? You has no clan right. Clans are overrated. Nalto said defensively, glaring at the samurai. I'll be Hokid. Believe it. Right. Just as soon as I grow a third arm. The samurai muttered looking away as Nalto's glare intensified. He was tired of that tired of every bastard he told his dream to rolling their eyes or outright laughing. When he was Hokid he was going to find this bastard and show him. He was going to show everyone. So Hokid is your goal. The grass nin asked, his tone intense. Nalto blinked looking at him. Yay. I'm going to be Hokid. Hokid. Ryo chirped and grinning Nalto scooped the girl up and deposited her on his shoulders. For some reason Nalto did not mind her so much anymore and she seemed to has grown extremely fond of him. The man his face hidden by his bamboo hat was silent for a moment. Is what that samurai said true? You do not have a clan. What is it with this damn clan question? Nalto responded loudly. They're not that great, or anything. I agree, one's clan says little about one's intrinsic worth. Still a powerful clan can be an invaluable asset in the political world of a hidden village. The grass nin said, reaching up to shift his bamboo hat, revealing his average looking face. I am a Kurumugup future Susui of Kusegaka. Nalto stared at the man curiously, taking in his odd green yellow eyes. He had never seen those kind of eyes before, and really, they were the only outstanding thing about the man's face. Then he registered what the man said and blinked. Don't you mean Kusakich? Kusa is not one of the five. Mug answered, frowning slightly. Someday, I hope it will be. But until then Susui is all we will need. Oh. Nalto managed then grinned. Well great. Yes. Mug agreed then tilted his head slightly. You do know it is rude to not tell me your name, since I has given you mine. Hey. My name's Vzumeki Nalto. Nalto could not help but smile even more. I will remember that name. Mug said seriously. Nodding. I will carve it into my memory. The name of one who will become Hokid. Nalto silent for a moment, then grinned, nodding to himself. I'll do the same to you. What about me? Ryo suddenly interjected, leaning forward, sounding put out. Nalto stuck his tongue out at her then laughed, when she mimicked him. I'm sure we'll both remember your name too. Mug said seriously, with a hint of a smile before shifting his bamboo hat back into place. 1999, 2000, 2001. Anko stopped counting steps long enough to take in her surroundings. It was a sharply rising hill covered with brittle yellow grass flanked on either side by even larger grass-covered hills. Looking back she saw Nalto, then looked around at the field stretching out before her. It was a vast plain made up of thorny vines and other odd plants that Anko was quite sure were very toxic if handled improperly. It was a virtual death walk, if they were guided improperly. Then she spotted the village, Dead center it was located on the other side of a fast-flowing river that was spanned by a wooden bridge. To the east of the village the land was flat, and somewhat higher. 
Most importantly however was that the protection besides the highly dangerous plants minus was the wall that stretched to enclose the entire village. It was not as imposing as the wall which surrounded Kanawa, barely a quarter its height, but still it would buy some time to its defenders if Kusa were ever attacked. Nalto. Get up here. Seconds later the blonde joined her, Ryo absent from his side. Anko felt her annoyance bubble at that, she had told him to always keep that girl near him. Not taking her eyes of the vast field in front of her spoke to him, almost in a hiss. Don't touch anything. I mean it. What the hell? Nalto blinked, staring at her before he turned his gaze to the plane. By the way, Anko hissed looking at him. I thought I told you to keep a close watch on that girl until we were in the village. The blonde glanced at her, then smiled reaching back to scratch his head. Oh. Hair. Idiot. Anko hissed glaring at him. What kind of ninja are you ho? I suppose you left her with a samurai. Like that could keep an enemy ninja from killing her. They're all wounded. Nalto squinted at her, then stuck his tongue out. At least I'm not dressed like a damn hooker. What did you say? Anko grated out, eyes narrowing as a wave killer, intent started to radiate off her. I didn't stutter. Nalto said evenly. Okay runt, you get your ass moving, while I escort Ryo. Anko said sweetly, shudging her hands into her coat pockets. She would teach the little brat to back talk her. Watching him scowling as he walked forward Anko grinned and cut a hand around her mouth. Hey. Watch out for the man-eating fly traps. What? Nalto shouted turning to look at her, eyes wide in fear. Seeing Anko's continued glare and smile he turned and continued on his way mumbling. Anko watched him closely, noting that Noga was following his lead. Scowling she motioned for everyone else to go ahead, taking Ryo's hand the instant she was close enough. Nalto was, even if no one would admit it on average a good judge of character. He was not sure why or how he had developed this ability but he could almost feel instinctively what a person was really like. It was basically, besides his sheer stubbornness, the only reason he had managed to survive long enough to reach Enin. Thus the strange boy walking beside him through this odd valley of plants puzzled him. Nalto could feel a sense of unease in his stomach, a vague feeling of badness. Yet the boy had yet to say a word outside of introducing himself. So Nalto did the only thing he could think of, put the boy as far out of his mind as he possibly could. It was a red, almost orange-colored flower that caught his attention. It was large, reaching his knee and he wondered if maybe Sakura would like it. He even reached out to pluck said flower when a firm hand grasped his wrist stopping him short. Blinking in surprise he looked up at Noga, who was staring at him with intent yellow-green eyes. I wouldn't do that. The boy said after a moment as Nalto yanked his arm free and stood upright once more. Why not? It's just a flower. Sakura-chan would love it. Nalto said glancing at the flower once more. How could she not love it? That color was almost perfect for her. That plant is called a shana, literally blood flower, Noga said blandly. I highly doubt that any girl would appreciate a flower that spits a flesh-dissolving genome. Oh. Right. Nalto said taking a half step away from the plant, noting it intently before glancing back at the boy who was walking once more. Grumbling the blonde started walking as well, knowing that the polite thing would be to thank the boy, but he just did not have that in him. After several minutes Noga spoke up once more his tone bland as ever. Do you really intend to become Hokiv? Yep. Nalto answered enthusiastically he was always willing to discuss his goal. The greatest Hokiv ever. Why? Noga asked, glancing to the left at a variety of plants. To make everyone acknowledge me. Nalto said seriously. I see. Noga said lightly, before pointing at a group of vines with a delicious looking red fruit creeping close to the path. Those small vines with the fruit are called hibernia vines they induce forgetfulness and a very slow death. Nalto was silent for a moment, then looked at him. You're smart. Kusa ninja are experts in poisons and plants. Noga said casually. Glancing at him. Unlike you soft Kanoan ninja, we grow up with our lives depending on our knowledge. Oh. Nalto said, before bristling slightly. Oi. Soft. Who the hell do you think you are? I am a genin of Kusa, second eldest son of the grass Daimyo and stronger than you. Noga said disdainfully glaring at Nalto. To be hokid so that people will acknowledge you. 
That is a pointless goal. Those that are weaker, then you are little more than feeble sheep. Why would anyone wish for their acknowledgement? Fear should be your goal, they should fear you. That is the only acknowledgement worth anything. Oi! Nalto shouted grabbing the boy's arm and yanking him around violently. Take that back. Do not touch me. Noga said, his eyes narrowed as he wrenched his arm free. Anyone that wishes to be a cave is not much better than a rabid dog. The cave system is a sickness, a plague of the human race. To do real good, you must overturn that archaic system and create a new role. You have to conquer people's fear and use it to control them. You. Nalto shouted before lashing out blindly. The result was a satisfying crunch as his knuckles clashed against the daimyo's son's cheek, knocking him off his feet. Nalto stood there for a moment, then snorting in disgust turned and stormed on ahead leaving the boy behind. Sitting up, Noga touched his bruised cheek as he spit out blood, then narrowing his eyes climbed to his feet staring intently after the blonde. Anko could feel her patience wearing thin as the Kusa gate guards argued with Mug about some inane, little procedural detail. It was all she could do to keep from slaughtering them and letting herself through the gate. Even Nalto, who was now back to carrying Ryo was looking highly agitated, which was not such a surprise really. Finally, just before Anko snapped, the gate swung open, and Mug lead the group inside the walls of Kusa village. Well not really a village, it was odd, or at least a village in the sense that she was used to. The buildings all else seemed to be built up of plants grown from the ground, leaving her a feeling that she was walking in some sort of bizarre forest. It was definitely strange, and she did not like it. She knew enough about grass nins to know they were strongest when surrounded by nature, and this village was nothing but nature. Suddenly, Mug stopped walking and turned facing them. Welcome, to Kusa village. That said he motioned with his hand toward a group of samurai even as the escorting ninja peeled away. We has prepared proper lodgings for your group and the Susui has made his private bathhouse available to you. On behalf of everyone thank you. Taishi said politely, inclining his head ever so slightly. As for our wounded. Oh yes, well don't worry I'm sure, the Susui will make sure they are well cared for. Mukuk said with a genial smile. Anko however could feel eyes on her and she tensed, readying for an ambush. Mug seemed to see it and quickly explained, his tone soothing. Please forgive the villagers. They are not used to strangers. Maanko aloud then focused her attention on Nalto who was standing next to her. Oi, give Ryo to one of the samurai. Nalto hesitated obviously remembering what she had said to him earlier, but he did as ordered, and then without so much as a polite word, although Anko started walking in a random direction motioning for him to follow her which he did. There were several reasons she had separated them from the group, but primarily she was a woman of her word and she had promised Nalto Ran. The shop they found was small crammed between larger buildings and, oddly enough it seemed too has built out of something, other than a natural material, it almost looked like rusted metal that had been fused together. Not that it mattered, even Nalto's infatuation with Rana Anko figured anything would be fine. A thin, balding man behind the counter beamed at the two of them as they entered the shop. As soon as he was sure they were not about to leave, he gave them a customary greeting welcome to Lower No Run, which Anko waved off glancing at Nalto curiously. Are you sure this is okay? Nalto asked as he took his seat beside Anko, who was already ordering Dango, Run and Say. We won't be needed just yet. Anko muttered glancing at him. You noticed that the others were getting cleaned up right? Yay. Nalto said scowling slightly. Shouldn't we be doing that? No, Anko said flatly grabbing her sake as soon as it was put in front of her. Haven't you noticed that all the grass ninja are extra clean? They've got their daimyo here. We're Kanoa ninja, the only one we clean up for is our daimyo. Besides, the ninja will notice the blood on our clothes. That's a good intimidation factor. Oh. Nalto said, his attention diverting to his ram which he quickly attacked, much to the amusement of Anko, who selected one of her sticks of dango. A moment of silence passed over them silence, in which Anko began to wonder just how much ram the boy could pack away he was already on his 8th bowl minus. So. How'd I do? Ho. Nalto suddenly asked, his tone excited and staring at her expectantly. I. Anko hesitated, unsure of what to say. Scowling for a moment, she thought about it then nodded. Better than my first teammates. Really? Nalto said happily turning back to his run. Yay. 
You're still alive. Anko scowled turning back to Hodango and say, That's a vast difference between you and them. Coughing Nalto hit his chest before staring at her. Grinning Anko glanced at him, her eyes almost gleaming. Something wrong. No. Nalto shouted, before returning to his meal reluctantly. Grinning Anko took a vicious bite out of her dango, shifting to a different subject. So, why'd you hit Noga? He insulted the Hokid and said that the only way to real power was to control people through fear. Nalto growled, snapping a chopstick. Cursing he tossed the broken stick aside and selected a new set. I see. Anko muttered, eyebrows drawing together. So Noga and her former sensei thought the same way about power, that was interesting. Thank Kami Noga did not have any real strength or power as a ninja, he was just some minor grass genin. Otherwise it would be Arakamal all over again. In Anko's opinion one was enough. Hey, Anko. Nalto suddenly asked, staring at his empty ramen bowl. HN. What was your first mission like? Nalto asked curiously looking at her. None of your business. Anko answered sharply, focusing on her dango. She did not want to talk about that. That atrocity. Please. Nalto pleaded and Anko sighed setting her dango down before glaring at him. My first mission was nothing like yours. Anko said firmly, narrowing her eyes. I just. Nalto started then stopped scowling slightly. I don't know anything about you. Anko snorted grabbing her dango and taking an extra vicious bite out of it. Anko knew what he wanted, he wanted something to judge his own actions against. Anko had wanted the same damn thing from Orokumar. Still, did not mean it was a good idea to tell him about her fist mission. If only she had known then what she now knew about her former sensor. Sighing Anko began talking without thinking. Nanking was not a pleasant mission. The mission started simple enough, but things got out of control quickly. It was during the war with the stone, back toward the beginning before Oro sensor left on his quest. W was it? Nalto hesitated then stared at her. Did you kill anyone? Yay. Anko trolled glaring darkly at her sake. This tastes like water. Setting it down hard she glanced at him. Nanking was a piss ant village on the earth country's border. But they were using it to launch attacks against waterfall. So my team was ordered to solve the problem. Wow. Nalto breathed staring at her his or was hard to miss. Anko bristled turning to lock eyes with him her angry boiling up. Don't you say wow. It was a pointless mission that should has never happened the way it did. Nalto frowned slightly but wisely kept his mouth shut as Anko forced herself to calm back down. Oh, what the hell am I getting worked up about? Look, this was your first kill and things will get easier. Just don't dwell on it okay? Yay. But. Nalto hesitated face softening, as his hand reached to his chest. I feel like. Something's wrong with me. The more I think about it the less I feel, the more detached. Anko scowled for a moment then reached out and picked up her cup of sake and handed it to him. Just means you're taking a step toward being a real ninja. When Nalto just stared at the drink she chuckled. Hurry up runt, we've got to go make sure the ambassador isn't murdered or something. Standing she watched as Nalto first sniffed the drink and then took a tentative sip. His face contorted and he spewed the vile liquid across the counter. Anko could not help but laugh, both at the foul look on Nalto's face and the even fouler look on the ramen chefs. They were quickly met by samurai clad in green and black and who led through the moderately busy streets toward the center of the village. As the grass samurai led them deeper into the building, and Nalto quickly became lost he would never find his way out without some form of help. They climbed winding, defensible stairs, and went along additional corridors and up more stairs. Shafts of sunlight from the wall embrasures cast intricate patterns across the floor as Nalto stole glances out the windows when he could, to judge how high they had climbed. Then suddenly the corridor, they were in turned a sharp corner sharply and ended fifty paces away. They were greeted by masked samurai, each in green and black uniforms protecting a door. Each with right hand on the sword hilt, left on the scabbard motionless and ready. Their focus never wagered from the group and it was quickly explained by the officer a middle, aged man minus that while the fire samurai could remain to remain armed both ninja would have to surrender their weapons. Anko. Nalto asked curiously staring at the dark-haired woman. Go ahead. 
Then she gave them a look that clearly said give them the obvious weapons. Naruto picked up the cue and he quickly produced his weapons pouch and kunai leg holster. Disarmed for the most part, the officer motioned to the rest of his men who moved aside allowing the captain to open the thick door before turning to bow them through. The first thing that struck Naruto was the fact that for all the pomp the room was not very large or impressive. The kneeling mats were even faded and they had chosen to go with the odd color scheme of green and black. These, what was up with this obsession? Overall, in Naruto's opinion, the place was sorely lacking in atmosphere. Now maybe if they had some orange and pink here and there. Naruto blinked, noticing that he was the only one still standing in the doorway, and quickly hurried to catch up to the group where they were all now standing before a dais near the center of the room. Not even Naruto distracted as he was by his musing about pink and orange furniture minus could not miss the five samurai kneeling in a circle around the dais, nor the ten kneeling on each side of the room all silently focused on the man sitting on atop the dais dais silently. Several minutes passed where no one acknowledged the group, much to Naruto's mounting annoyance. These could they sit down already or at least start talking. Ugh. Fine if everyone else wanted to play quiet mouse, still mouse then he was going to ask the damn question. Oi. Can we sit down already? Nalto demanded belligerently arms crossed. All eyes within his group flashed to Nalto while the seated man dressed in surprisingly simple but clean robes turned his gaze upon him. The seated man's gaze was steady and Nalto felt an almost overwhelming power reach out rooting him in his place. These this was just freaky. Then the man shifted his gaze to the ambassador, offering a faint smile. Please, has a seat. Letting out a breath he did not realize he had been holding Nalto sat down propping a hand on his knee and glaring around him. Daimyo Yutegabukai. Teishi said cordially. Ambassador. Yutegabukai replied politely. I has heard that you had a minor problem on the trip to Kusa. Yes. Unfortunately a bund of missing nins ambushed us. Teishi answered gravely before relaxing. Thankfully our Kanoa Ninja and Fire Country Samurai Escort was more than enough to handle the problem. Thankfully. Yutegabuki agreed, then shifted his gaze to the red-headed, girl held in the arms of a red-clad samurai. This is Keisivi Ryo. Yes. The papers will be summoned shortly, security has been extra tight. Teishi nodded then glanced at something to the left of the daimyo. I thought that the Susui would be present to this. Oh. Did you not know? Sadly the last Kusa Susui died due to ill health a week ago. Thankfully Kusa managed to select a new Susui and he hurried to lead a group of his fellow ninja to meet you as scheduled. Silence. Naruto scowled, wondering who in the hell they would have selected as their new leader. He prayed it was not Noga, that little prick didn't deserve to run a ninja village. Sadly he could not figure out who it would be yet he felt like he was forgetting something. Or someone. Uck. Who the hell was it? I am sorry to hear, that if our daimyo had known. All the hokish. Teishi offered weakly only to be waved off by the grass daimyo. It is of no real consequence. Pausing the older man turned as one of the doors at the back of the room opened and a tall young man with a plain face and yellow-green eyes entered the room. He stopped, scanned the group then smiled faintly locking his gaze on Nalto. Coming to the front he bowed in greeting to the ambassador and Ryo then moved to join the daimyo on the Diaz. As he passed Nalto heard him whisper. I told you I'd be Susui. No way. Nalto shouted, watching as Mokup sat on a mat, just below the grass daimyo on the Diaz. I see you two know each other. The daimyo said, genially, addressing Nalto. I trust you also met my son Noga, he is quite anxious to participate in the tune-in exams. Him. Nalto blurted, eyes wide and the daimyo allowed an odd smile to flitter across his face. Yes. He is the most suited for the task. The daimyo glanced out of a high, narrow window then looked back at the ambassador. If you do not mind, I would like to wait for Hitori before we attend to this important matter. Of course we wouldn't dream of doing this without the esteemed regent of Kusa. Oh, you've already heard of his promotion. The daimyo asked blandly, but even Nalto could see the way his eyes narrowed, as if in surprise. He was only just announced as the regent a few days ago. I overheard it when we arrived my lord. Teishi said. His voice however betrayed a certain smugness that had Nalto smirking in satisfaction. Mug smiled at the nurse politely as she led him into the small examination room the girl returned a smile shyly then departed leaving the Susui alone. 
Glancing at the mostly white room he cracked his neck, then walked over to the examination table and hopped on staring at the door expectantly. Seconds later the door opened and a young woman, with short black hair and an outfit that hugged her figure perfectly entered the room. Susui Sama. Or W. Seichan. You can still call me Mug. The young man complained, smiling as charmingly as he could at her. I am the chief doctor on duty. Say said airily even as she closed the door and walked over to the counter. Proper protocol must be observed. Oh, give me a break. Mug muttered, following her with his eyes before glancing at the counter, where she was working a minor summoning to produce his medical file. Say Chan, we've skinny dipped together for Kami's sake. I think protocol can be set aside between us. Right. Just as soon as there is a ring on this finger. The woman in question said, holding her left hand up and wiggling the ring finger. Until then you are the Susui of Kusa. These. Mug sighed looking away. Now what exactly brings you by? Did you get injured on this escort trip? Now nothing like that. Mug paused then lowered his voice. H. Say Chan you think you could make sure that you are my primary physician. I really don't trust anyone else with my body. Say glanced at him, a teasing smile on her lips. Oh. Don't worry I has already taken care of that. Besides, I has plans for that body. Becoming serious again she crossed her arms, turning to rest against the counter. So what brings you by if you are not hurt? We've signed the new non-aggression treaty with Fire Country. Mug said, his tone equally serious. The daimyo however does not plan on honoring it, he's got an insane plan. But that's not really why I'm here, though if Aninda shows up with a girl named Ryo, I want you to run as far as you can with her. Say blinked then nodded. Of course. Now why are you here? Well. It's nothing too serious, I'm just curious to your opinions on someone. Mug answered and then seeing her attention laid out everything he had observed and heard about Nalto. It took a full 20 minutes to cover all the details including going back to clarify some things when Say asked him to. Finally he reached the end and sighed leaning back on his hands. So whatcha think? Without a sample of his blood and a very secure location to test it I cannot really be sure. Say answered chewing her bottom lip. But if, within a span of 24 hours, his shoulder healed completely and he was acting as if nothing was ever wrong, I would say there is a strong possibility he has an advanced bloodline. He does not has a clan though. Well. There are lost clans they said slowly, almost scowling clans who were exterminated for one reason or another. During the ninja wars there were a large number of clans that were targeted, whole families wiped out by the warring factions. Also, in some parts of the world clans with bloodlines are greatly feared by the common people and thus their members tend to fall prey to mob violence. He could has come from one of them. Maybe. Mug aloud then shook his head, wishing he could has a more concrete answer. Mug Kun, I know why you're so interested in him. Say suddenly said, her reddish eyes softening. He does sound an awful lot like you when we were growing up. An orphan who was rejected, but do you really think it's a good idea to care so much about him? If we are going to act against Kanoa, he will probably be involved in the fighting. He's going to be hokid though, Mug said, smiling faintly. He could not explain in words how he could believe those words so completely. Yet the instant he had heard the child declare that his dream was to be hokid Mug had known, the boy was not just another Kanoa ninja. You actually believe that? Say asked seriously, leaning forward slightly to stare at him intently. She always did this, when they were talking about such important matters. Yes. As you make Inalto is going to be somebody important. Mug grinned slightly, sitting upright. I just feel it. That's why I'm giving him my family scroll. What? Say shouted staring at him in shock. Are you a complete barker? Giving him that scroll? Do you realize what you would be giving him? Easy say Chan. Don't you say Chan me. The young woman fumed glaring at him. You honestly want to give your family's scroll to this Kanoa ninja that thinks he will grow up to be Hokid. Well, um em. Yay. Mug admitted shyly. But let me explain why. It had better be a damn good explanation a Kuro Mug. It is. The Susui said hastily, then nodded. I'll admit. I has not known Nalto very long. But he is enough like me that I feel compelled to help him. Plus, the scroll is not so special, when I was a kid, 
I just found some obscure Kusa Jutsus and wrote them down. But you said it was all you had left of your family. Say retorted incredulously. I lied. Mokuk said then grinned. Besides, I can always make another family scroll. Mokuk, that is not the point. You will be helping a Kanoa ninja, they has nearly ruined our country. It would be a betrayal of all of our ancestors. Say Chan. Mokuk said then narrowed his eyes. Kanoa ninja are not our enemies and when he becomes Hokage, I would rather that he count us as friends. Besides I has more important things to worry about, like what our illustrious daimyo is planning. Mokukun this is. You are gambling our safety on a boy. Nalto is going to be in a position to control the most dominant, military force on this continent, someday and I would prefer to has him remember me as someone that helped him out. You just don't get it do you? Say said hopelessly staring at him. Mokuk slid off the examination table, meeting her gaze evenly. Arai-san, you are the one that does not get it. I am not interested in a war that happened 50 or 100 years ago, or the avenda of petty politicians. All I am interested in is protecting my village, and maybe someday trading Susui for Kusakich. That said he tried to give her a quick kiss on the lips, but Sei turned her head, not relaxing her posture one bit. Sighing the young man shook his head and turned, leaving the room behind. His shoulders were tense and he looked more serious than ever in the entire time he had lived in the village. Inside his pocket he felt a small box press against his hand. Clutching it he sighed and shook his head. Someday he would ask. Oh. Why are we sleeping outside again? Nalto asked as laid out his sleeping roll across from the log that Anko was sitting on. It's safer. Anko answered curtly, scowling. We messed up someone's plans on our way here and sleeping in the inn near the others would only put them at greater risk. Ho. Oh. Why yes. I thought they were after Ryo. Shouldn't we be protecting her? Nalto grumbled, obviously annoyed. Barker. Ryo has been delivered. Ho oh, safety is Kusa's job now. No, we will be targeted because we interfered with their job. It's an honor thing. HNN. But how is it safer out here? Nalto continued to grumble flopping on his bedding to stare up at the sky. Well, you hear all those insects. Anko retorted closing her eyes preparing herself for the assassination attempt she knew was coming. Yay. Well jail go quiet when someone starts approaching. They're used to us, so they don't care what we do as long as we stay relatively quiet but outsiders will startle them. Anko explained slipping a kunai out of her forearm holster. Not even Unbu can keep insects from noticing them, as a matter of fact, I can count only two people that could move with such stealth that even nature would not notice them. Ho. Who? Freya Sama and the Yondem. Anko answered softly, concentrating. Which shouldn't be a surprise since Freya trained the Yondem. Whoa. Nalto said, sitting up in his bed. So even your sensor could not move that quietly. He had other tricks but he was pretty damn close to it. Anko retorted glancing to her right. Did you know Nalto that according the ancestor myths, there is a land that is perpetually covered in ice and snow? Not like snow country either, but so cold that the ice never melts. Were humans are animals, with fur and live in caves made of ice. Ho. Nalto scratched the back of his head curiously. Ancestors. You've never heard of them? Anko asked surprise filling her tone. I thought everyone knew of them. Oh. Uh, well of course I know of them. Nalto said, obviously lying. The ancestors were an ancient people, they were almost gods. Anko said, snorting. They could travel to the stars and the depths of the ocean. They were powerful and ruled the whole planet, it said they had weapons that were more powerful than any jutsu. No way. Nalto breathed and Anko grinned faintly remembering the first time that Freya and Arakamal had told her the story. The ancestors could store whole libraries of knowledge, so that they took up no more than a stack of scrolls and heal almost any disease create life from nothing. Anko continued, still toying with her kunai. The gods grew jealous and angry. But they also feared the ancestors. Why? Nalto asked, leaning forward anxiously. Because the ancestors were on the cusp of something that only the gods themselves possessed. Anko said slowly meeting his gaze. Immortality. It was within their grasp and they asked of creation who can compare to our greatness. The gods could not allow it. They struck down the ancestors. The gods struck with cataclysmic earthquakes, 
floods and when those had failed to cripple the ancestors the gods opened the gates of hell on them. Were. Nalto asked, eyes wide. The god sent honey of all sorts, twisted and malformed spirits and even the fearsome tailed demons like the Kyubi, who destroyed them. Anko explained calmly. Many of the demons were destroyed in their war with the ancestors, but ultimately the ancestors and their civilization was destroyed. Yet the gods were unable to destroy all of the ancestors' knowledge, or the descendants of the ancestors. Descendants. Nalto asked with a frown in his tone before blinking. You mean the children? You really didn't think that such a powerful race could have been destroyed completely? Of course some survive and those few are white and how we use jutsus. Why didn't Oka Sensei tell us this stuff in the academy? Nalto exclaimed. This is why more interesting than most everything else he taught us. It's not a well-known piece information. Anko said, staring at him. I only know because two of the Sanins shared an interest in them. Do you really think they existed? Nalto asked after a moment, laying back on his bed and Anko shook her head. Doesn't matter they're gone now. Staring at his stretched out form she sighed. Get some sleep brat, you've got second watch. She listened closely until she heard his soft snores and then she relaxed slightly. If there was going to be an attack she preferred it happen while he was sleeping. Who would it be? One of the ninja that had escorted them or a samurai. It was too bad that Hideori himself was in the capital or she'd has gutted him well before now. Well until then she would just wait closing her eyes she allowed herself a few moments of peace. Anko jerked into alertness and threw herself into a forward shoulder roll as a hail of weapons crashed into the log she had been dozing on. Reaching Nalto's side she grabbed his shoulder yanking him out of his sleeping roll, just as another series of deadly objects rained down. Ho. Where? Nalto managed trying desperately to wake up, while Anko literally dragged him to the only place they would have cover at. Anko. Was gone on. He managed to ask, the entire time yawning. Scowling she shoved him against the fallen tree, eyes darting everywhere. Were being attacked you idiot. Now stay quiet. That hiss she strained to hear, where the next attack would come from, but instead heard the rapid rustling of leaves, signaling that a ninja was attempting to escape. Like hell you're getting away. Anko hissed before leaping into the trees and gave chase to the noise. Branches trees and bush whipped past her eyes focused entirely on the movement ahead, she was closing the distance. Timing her leap with his she produced a kunai, and let it fly in a smooth execution, which rewarded her with a scream from in front. Smiling in mild satisfaction, Anko sped onwards bursting into a clear to find the ninja waiting, a dark spot spreading at his waist. The ninja started to form hand seals the second she appeared, but Anko cut him short by throwing another kunai, piercing his shoulder to render one arm useless. The man grabbed his shoulder for a moment, before reaching for his kunai holster with his good arm. In that moment Anko moved flipping out of the tree she landed and darted in a slightly zigzag pattern before striking. Time seemed too slow to a crawl as he swept his dagger at her desperately trying to by himself room, but Anko ducked it and slipping an arm around his, as she drove a kunai deep into his other shoulder. She followed this up with a palm heel to his chin and a kick to the knee toppling him. The instant he collapsed onto his back she drove the knee into his solar plexus another kunai coming out to press against his throat. Seconds later she heard the crashing noise of a hurrying Nalto she looked up, just as he burst into the clearing in a dead run. Damn it. Nalto shouted skidding to a halt, his breathing rag. Did he get a war? The boy suddenly trailed off and Anko narrowed her eyes. Are you? A hey, Anko are you going to? Nalto gulped keeping a careful distance from her. Anko could feel a hint of imbalance in his emotions, this was why she had waited for him to catch up. Turning back she stared into the horrified ninja's face, her tone cold. Death is our art we make it every day with our hands. And part of us becomes desperate to know, what's it like? Suddenly her hand made a slicing motion, spraying blood into her face. She remained seated through the man's death throes and did not move or speak until he was finished. Nodding she stood, kunai held loosely in her hand as she turned to stare at Nato under the moonlight. Ninja, a death personified. Even Hokages, and you better, accept that. Nato stared at Ho then looked away. When I'm fighting, the woman said conversationally while wiping the bloodied blade on the back of her hand. It's like the whole world goes away. Everything boils down to I'm gonna win, and they're gonna lose. B, but you killed him. 
even after he was helpless. Nalto said, eyes wide staring at her once more. Yea, and he would has killed us if I had been soft-hearted. Anko said blandly, looking up at Nalto sharply. I didn't chose to be like this. I would has loved to be like Kurenai. I would has loved to grow up dating and thinking about nail polish. Slipping her kunai back into her holster her face grew hard. I was baptized in blood, like you. My sensor made sure I could be the best killer ever, so excuse me Nalto if when faced with a man that would happily kill me, I happily kill him instead. There was a moment of silence, following her tirade and then Nalto stared at her intently. So. Am I going to be like you? No, Anko said after a moment starting back to the camp. You're going to curse every life you take. But you'll accept it as part of the job. Ho. Anko turned back to stare at him, I sat even though he could not tell in the darkness. That'll be the difference Nalto. You'll keep your humanity. She stopped when she heard the hurried steps behind her, and then almost cursed, when she felt him wrap his arms around her. For a moment she wondered, what the hell he was doing, and then it registered, despite his clumsiness, he was trying to hug her. She waited several moments, and then spoke up her tone edged with a threat. Stop being a damn moron and get back to camp. It's your turn to keep watch. When Nalto released her and walked ahead silently, she wondered. Why? The air was dry, yet cool, with just enough clouds peppering the sky that there was hope to rain. The upside was that it would be greatly appreciated the downside was that the clouds blocked much of the light from the brightening sky. This meant it was not dark out, which in turn meant Nalto was not wasting his training time. True for any accuracy, he had to almost squint, but he could make out the vague target he had designed Sasuke's face pinned to a tree minus and sent his kunai hurtling. It struck a few inches off center, rumbling he produced a brace of shrikken for each hand and launched them. Sadly only one or two even hit the tree, the others scattered into the darkened makeshift training area. Damn it. Nalto shouted sitting down heavily and glaring at the tree. Why did he suck at using weapons? He was picking up the teivutsu fast enough he could even use both tutsus that his sensei had taught him moderately well. So why was it that he could not use weapons even half as good as anyone from the academy? He had no talent with the damn things. But he could not just give up, he needed to learn. To be hokid meant a lot of practice. Now though, now it was dark and, as much as he hated to admit it, he could not really see in the dark. Plus his body was starting to protest the lack of sleep, yet he remained where he was knowing that if he stopped practice, he would start thinking. If he was not clowning or practicing, or working he would start seeing the man's face that he had killed. And he would feel queasy. Nalto was not a killer and yet he had felt a momentary thrill. That scared him. Shaking it all off he quietly climbed to his feet and walked forward gathering his weapons before glancing at his slumbering teacher. She had not approved of his hug, but she had sounded like a lot of the kids he remembered. And that was what everyone did to make other people happy. He did not understand. Maybe he had hugged her the wrong way. Sighing he sat down heavily once more and crossed his arms utterly confused. Which meant his mind started to roam. Scowling he started telling himself joke after joke, determined to keep it all locked away, and to do as Anko had said. He was going to accept it. He was. And he wasn't crying. He had just pulled a muscle. Leaning against the wall, beside the only gate leading into Kusa, Anko kept glancing curiously at the gathered Kusa ninja. They were not clumped together, yet it was obvious they were more than passively curious. To make matters worse, none of them were from the group that escorted them into the village yesterday. That Barker. If we has to wait one more minute. Anko muttered, beginning to twirl a kunai on her finger. Narrowing her eyes she considered the village and everything that had happened there. Her early morning report would reach the hokage about noon. Sighing she closed her eyes for a moment before catching her kunai, so that she could cross her arms and prop her foot up against the wall. His loud energetic voice chattering happily reached her first, and then she saw the blonde walking toward them talking, animatedly with the susui and ryo in his orange jacket holding his hand. I didn't think that actually came off. Anko muttered staring at the jacket, which practically swallowed the girl. Snorting she glanced back at Nalto this time paying attention to what he was wearing, it took her a moment to register, but finally the black shirt and orange pants combo hit her. Don't worry, I will personally be watching over her. The Susui said, smiling, as he ruffled Ryo's hair. 
Anko rolled her eyes, she was impatient and wasn't going to hide it. She wanted to be back in Fire Country Borders, where she could get another mission. Aruto. Ryo. Aruto. Anko reached up and rubbed the bridge of her nose turning away from those two hugging and acting so damn stupid. She felt the shift in weight and opened her eyes to see the ambassador and his samurai all grinning. Gods, why couldn't they just get moving so this would all be over with? Seeing a stray viper she hulled her kunai severing its head good. Nasty things vipers. We don't has all day. Anko interjected suddenly, letting her annoyance bleed through. Bah. Came Nalto's response but he quickly joined the team near the gate. So what kept you? Anko asked, frowning at him. Seeing the way his smile widened she glowered darkly. Well. We've been waiting for you all this time and now you're not even going to offer an explanation. Yup. Nalto said turning to wave to crying Ryo, his own eyes watering up. Come on moron. Anko almost growled, reaching out to grab the back of his shirt and drag him behind her as the group started walking, with Akusa ninja in the lead and one of the daimyo's son under fire samurai guard. Anko sighed. So, are you going to tell me or not? Nalto smiling pulled free then put his hands behind his head. It's Nunya. Nunya. Anko repeated blankly staring at him. He nodded trying and failing to look serious. non I abuse us. You do remember we're practicing Teivutsu when we get back. Nalto paled. That's it to this part if you enjoyed it then like share and subscribe to the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out the other playlist hope you would like them too.